before we get started, let's take a minute to pay the bills and thank today's sponsor. Now you might have noticed that I look a little bit different today, and uh, thanks, I shaved. But part of that is because I'm coming at you from a new angle from my webcam, courtesy of today's sponsor, Flexispot, and their new standing desk that they sent me. They hooked me up with one of their electric standing desks, and it was remarkably easy to set up. The box says that it's a two-person job, and I am going to uh, legally advise you that you should have someone help yourself, uh, but I set it up by myself with no issue. Not saying you should do that, but take that how you will. It came pre-assembled with three parts you just need to screw together with the included hex wrench. It was really easy. Once it's all done and you plug the motor into the control box, you can just plug it right into the wall outlet and you're good to go. You got a couple of buttons that let you set the desired height, and it can go pretty low too if you're uh, weird like that. And then you can save that desired height as a preset using these four buttons by just holding it down to set it and then tapping it once to set it to that preset height. The drawer may only be an inch deep, but I could still fit my daily planner in there with some pens, floss sticks, and deodorant because no matter how much I put on, I can never rid myself of the sweat of the Patriots. Uh, the one from Metal Gear Solid, not literal Patriots, you know, what the video was about. Happy late 4th of July, by the way. So if you're in the market for one of these, check the affiliate link down below and use the code COMHARDDESK in all caps for an additional discount on top of the 50% discount that'll be available this Prime Day on July 11th and 12th. Ordering one from the link below will actually go towards supporting me directly, which will allow me to keep my editor paid so I can keep feeding him green beans and Dunkin' Donuts. Even if you're selfish and you don't really care about supporting the channel, following my affiliate link in the description will still give you an additional discount. But if you do want to support the channel and uh, still want one of these desks, uh, you know what to do. Allow me to take you back to a simpler time. A time before snakes and clones, 71 minute cutscenes, jeans, and memes. A time before phantoms, demons, patriots, ocelots. And who could forget the Lale Lule Lo? Wait, I think I said that already. Don't Metal Gear is a series synonymous with complex characters and convoluted stories, with a confusing, overarching narrative only rivaled by the likes of Kingdom Hearts. But as you might guess, it wasn't always this way. And if it weren't for the likes of Hideo Kojima and the system limitations of the MS. SX, a Japanese home computer that rose to popularity in the East, the series would have been much different. Now, Hideo Kojima, <laughs> this man is as perplexing as the games he creates. I'm not gonna tell you if the man's a secret genius or a guy with a superiority complex, I'll let you decide that on your own, but I will say that his creative passion for the video game industry is certainly commendable. He initially joined Konami in hopes of creating arcade or arcade-adjacent games for the Famicom Disk System, or the Nintendo Entertainment System us filthy Americans know it by, but due to I guess a mishap in the position that he applied for, he was only able to oversee production for games produced for the previously mentioned MSX home computer, where Konami was hoping to make their own competitor to Capcom's Commando, or Wolf of the Battlefield as it was known as in Japan. A top-down, run-and-gun shoot-em-up taking place in a non-specific forest, saving POWs or prisoners of war, and gunning down non-specific enemy troopers. The thing is, the MSX couldn't even dream of handling something this complex, at least not in a playable state, and that's where Kojima and his his passion for Western films really came into play. Despite pushbacks from higher up at Konami, young Hideo decided to push production into a more of a stealth focus, sneaking around enemy combatants and avoiding combat altogether if you can help it, apparently inspired by 1963's The Great Escape, creating a simple narrative of sneaking into a hostile fortified state and destroying a top secret super weapon that could bring upon the end of the world, ceremoniously dubbed Metal Gear. Or at least I think they created a simple narrative. I'm playing this on the PlayStation 3 re-release which has been updated from the original MSX release. And if you're looking to play the game in America, this is really the best bet you have, at least today. The only way that Americans got their hands on this genesis of espionage was on the NES. It was a bizarre twist on the MSX2 original that most of us wouldn't even get the chance to play until it was packaged with Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence on the PS2. A re-release of a re-release. But the port of Metal Gear 1 included in this package was an already modified port in itself, being a localized version of Metal Gear 1 made for mobile phones sold exclusively in Japan. This port added new difficulties and modes such as an easy mode and a boss rush with a reworked slash retcon script to properly fit it into the canon of the series at the time. The biggest retcon changing the game's scientist character Dr. Petrovich into Dr. Drago Petrovich Madnar, tying him in much closer to Raiden in the at the time upcoming entry Metal Gear Solid 4. Dr. Madnar, I've heard of him. 
But even then, the version that I'm playing on is not Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence, but Metal Gear Solid 3 HD, an upscaled port of the PS2 re-release. So let me break this down for you real quick. I am playing Metal Gear 1 on Metal Gear Solid 3 HD, a port of Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence, a port on a port of a re-release of a sequel that is actually a prequel featuring a localized port of a previously updated re-release for mobile phones of an MSX game. We haven't even started this game yet and it's already starting to baffle me. The premise, for the most part, is tucked away in the game's manual, which depending on the localization is going to give you mixed results. I started with the European manual for the original MSX release, which claims that Foxhound, a political covert operations unit created in response to regional complications and terrorist activities, sent to Agent Grey Fox to infiltrate the South African country Outer Heaven to expose Metal Gear, but lost all contact, sending in a newly recruited Solid Snake to rescue Grey Fox and continue his mission. And right away, the false information starts to make itself known. No, that is not an SMG, that is a Spaz shotgun. The Japanese manual is a bit more coherent. Now, I can't translate this myself, so I'm just going to be reciting what various wikis claim the manual says, so take this with a grain of salt. First off, Outer Heaven is not a country, but actually a very fortified state. Some may say what's the difference, but regardless, it's 200 kilometers north of Galsberg, South Africa, an already fictional country, so I have no idea where this is supposed to be geographically. Here we also learn that Outer Heaven was created by an unnamed legendary mercenary, which would be in line with the series as we know it going forward. And in a neat little detail, we also get these little frequencies for contacting our commander Big Boss, and empty spaces to jot down information for other characters as we meet them, and that's that's pretty cool. It's an admirable attempt of immersion. We also get some nice character portraits for our main cast, and while I'm sure Solid Snake was named after Snake Plissken from Escape from New York, it looks like Big Boss got the dominant genes of that transaction, selling the look with the eye patch and everything. Snake just looks like a 20-something Todd Howard, where Skyrim was only a twinkle in his nutsack. We got some specifications for some of Outer Heaven's armored infantry, including a tank, a Hind D, a Bull Tank, and Metal Gear TX-55. Which, if I didn't know any better, sounds like an overpriced Texas Instrument calculator. And yes, the Outer Heaven logo has a goddamn swastika on it. I'm glad the original version of the logo never came back, though. That would've made it a little hard to cheer for Venom Snake in Metal Gear Solid 5. I'm just saying. I'm gonna be tackling this game on the provided original difficulty, by the way. To my understanding, the difficulties only adjust the requirements to complete the game. There are other factors, like how much life you start with and etc. But I'll explain that in more detail as we go on. But without further ado, let's take up the mantle of Solid Snake in his first mission under Big Boss. Operation N313 is a go. This is Big Boss. Operation N13. Fuck. Operation Intrude N313 is a go. Make contact with Grey Fox and find Metal Gear. Use frequency 120.85 for communications. And just like that, our mission begins. No outside gear, of course. We can't leave a trace, this is a stealth mission, and all weapons and gear need to be picked off of other bodies. Aside from a carton of cigarettes, of course. Near the beginning of the fortress, we come across our first keycard. Needed to open up certain doors, though only usable when equipped in your equipment slot. Along with binoculars letting you check one screen nearby, and rations, essentially your med kits. As long as they're equipped, we'll heal you instantly if you take lethal damage. Which highlights our first obstacle in playing Metal Gear. Keycards, which are needed to open doors, and rations both take up the same equipment slot and need to be swapped out for one another. Once you approach a door, you gotta put away whatever you've got equipped to pull out your keycard. Something that's not too much of a problem right now, but as we move on... Oh boy. Getting spotted by enemy guards will set Outer Heaven into alert. Sort of. It feels random on whether or not an alarm will follow you onto the next screen or not, but if one thing is certain, one exclamation mark means you can move on to the next screen to dismiss the alarm, and two sends reinforcements after you onto the following screen, where I'm sure you could probably hide to reset the alarm at this point, but I just resort to punching out enemies until the alarm turns off. Yeah, aside from the results screen at the very end of the game, there's not really much of a consequence for killing here. In fact, it's usually more beneficial than it is not. Flat out removing guards from the screen, making stealth easier, and even have a chance of dropping rations or ammunition. 
Which, speaking of, early on you'll find a handgun, which is really good if you're in a pickle, but loud as hell, alerting everyone to your position. Thankfully, this time it equips to your own weapon slot, so it's not like you gotta put away your key to hold a gun. Shortly after, we find mines, which I only used one time in the entire run, and a gas mask, which isn't used often, but it is needed to cross rooms spouting toxic gas, though it does take up your equipment slot, leaving you scrambling for your keys like you're running through the Flying Dutchman's perfume department. Guards do respawn when off screen, so taking guards out regardless of if you set off the alarm will result in those guards reappearing once you re-enter the screen, which over time resulted in a playstyle where I avoided guards altogether just to save time, which I guess is what Kojima wanted, so hey, who am I to judge? Alright, now how the hell am I gonna get past these red guards without them seeing me? Looks like I've got a guardian angel. Alright, I guess floor three it is. Oh, what is that, a surveillance camera? This is Big Boss, watch out for surveillance cameras. Over. Yeah, I got it, boss, thanks. Cameras are exactly what you think. Avoid their line of sight, literally a line of sight, and no alarms go off. A pretty fair transaction. You'll also find some hostages down here, and on top of rescuing them simply because you're a good person, I know you are, rescuing hostages is also required to get a move on. You see that class meter down there at the bottom left? That's not just to represent your gross annual income, but is representative of how much gear you can hold, which is a complicated and indirect way of saying that it dictates whether or not you can beat a boss or not, as some bosses require a certain amount of gear or ammunition to take out, which I do like. It's not just a simple meter that says whether or not you can move on or not, it's actually using the gameplay to translate this. You can increase your class per 5 hostages you save, most of the time they won't really have much to say aside from the thank you, which by the way, you're very welcome, I don't know how you're gonna get out of here, but I'm glad I could help, but occasionally they'll drop a hint, like this guy who says that Diane from the Resistance will provide support on enemies on frequency 120.0. Point thirty-three, Which is worded a bit oddly, this is for bosses, but it's cool nonetheless. And yeah, we've got bosses in this game. Don't expect the existentially complicated bosses from later games, all we got here is Dirty Duck and Machine Gun Kid. We'll get there. Behold, the cylinder. Truly a weapon to surpass Metal Gear. Shortly after we find our second keycard, a whole slew of paths are now available to Snake. But then, one of the biggest gripes of the game makes itself known the moment you check your inventory. Yeah, those cards don't stack. And better yet, these doors aren't labeled. So if you don't know what door needs what key, every door then becomes that annoying kid that insists that you guess what he's thinking about and never tells you. Hey, do you remember the light capsule from Dark Necrobat stage in X5? When an electrified floor blocks your path, chances are there's a circuit box that needs to be destroyed to shut it off. But to do so, you'll need a remote control rocket, thankfully placed fairly liberally around the maps. Don't forget this though, because every time you re-enter that room, you'll need to break that circuit box again. You can just tank the damage if you want to, just be sure that you have the rations for it. But you know what you really need your rations for? Uh. Oh, the box! Man, even before I knew what Metal Gear was, the cardboard box has always been the pinnacle of stealth technology. And boy, it lives up to its reputation, rendering you practically invisible as long as you're not moving. They can walk right on top of you as long as you have the damage to tank it. This thing is fun as hell, and though it does break stealth down to its molecular level, it adds so much engagement to an already engaging gameplay system, in my opinion. Oh, what is this, an ambush? Get over here, you two-dimensional fuck. Alright, now we're talking a silencer. Turning your handgun into a silenced weapon, and when I say silenced, I mean silent. It doesn't alert a single nearby guard to your presence, so if you have the ammo to spare, this is a more expedient way of doing so. I still chose to punch guards out though, cause that seems to be the only way to have them drop rations or ammo, but man, if you're looking for a weapon that I swear that I never used, look no further than the grenade launcher. I'm pretty sure I only used this thing for a couple of boss fights, and even then it wasn't my first choice. At least I used it more than the goddamn mines. Oh Jesus, what the hell am I doing here? Big boss, where am I? Hello? Dad? This is the point that I learned that limited use items like rations, ammo, and mines, for whatever reason, respawn just like guards do. So if you find a room leaving you with rations or what have you, just run in and out a few times to fully replenish these resources. They left this in here, so either this is intentional or it was so cemented into the game's legacy that they just decided to keep it. Couldn't save me here though. Oh, 
All right, let's give the roof a try. Oh wait, it looks like the winds are too strong up here and I need a bomb blast suit, according to Big Boss. Yeah, that makes fucking sense. That's why we created bomb defusal outfits, right? To protect me against the fucking wind? Let's try it anyway. <laughs> oh, funny noises. A hostage tells us that Gray Fox has been moved to a secret holding cell, so that definitely complicates things. Oh my god, okay. Alright, let's uh, go to floor one. Save hostage. Grab submachine gun. Oh, that's kind of new. Save another hostage who tells us that the only way to make it to the hidden holding cells is to get caught, even though I've done that at least three times in the last ten minutes. So clearly there's something more to it. Oh fuck, where do I get captured at? The basement? Oh no, please don't make me kill the dog. The Last of Us 2 is a game. Ooh, an enemy uniform. Does it let me sneak by guards in plain sight? Nope, no it doesn't. Man, I hope I didn't just spend all that C4 on nothing. All right, for the upteenth time, floor one, save hostage, grab SMG, save hostage, eat rations, where the fuck am I? Oh, hello. Snake makes it to the secret holding cells of Outer Heaven, with Big Boss starting to act a little bit strange, suggests checking the walls, and this, I think, is how the game intends to teach you about breakable walls. Though this one... Alright, everyone talks about Punch a Boulder Redfield, but Snake here is breaking down the foundation of this fortress one wall at a time. Other breakable walls like this usually require plastic explosives, what I use to find the enemy uniform in the basement. And here, we finally make contact with Grey Fox, who dumps the revelation on us that Outer Heaven's Metal Gear isn't just the ultimate walking tank, but a nuclear walking tank, capable of firing a nuke to and from anywhere on the planet, and that the only person who could help us shut it down is Dr. Drago Madnar. Don't worry, Grey Fox. You're rescued now. Just sit here in your, your prison cell. Oh, I'm in the basement. Alright, I guess that makes sense. Oh, hello. I am the shot maker! No one has escaped from here! Oh, there's a first time for everything, fucko. Oh my god, he's firing bug spray at me. Oh, when in doubt, fist beats bug spray. Fuck. Alright, let's try these other rooms out. Oh, hey, look, my equipment. Ain't that fucking convenient. Yeah, I just spammed RC missiles. These things turn almost every boss into a non-threat. Shot maker drops our third key card, and with it, we grab the infamous bomb blast suit. Too bad we're not defusing any bombs here and just using it to walk through fucking wind. And yeah, you might have put it together by now, but I'm using a map for this game. I didn't exactly use a guide, I just used a map to tell me which doors take which keycards. Honestly, if the doors were labeled or the keycards stacked, I think I'd have a relatively non-frustrating time beating this game without a guide. At least this version. The roof has a lot of these red guards patrolling, turning and checking corners far more aggressively than their green variants. Definitely threatening, but you could still fight them off with nothing but your fists, so that's pretty cool. A hostage tells us that we're gonna need a parachute if we want to make it down to the courtyard, where we later find out that Dr. Madnar is being held. So I guess once we find the parachute, we find Dr. Madnar. Oh hey, what's this? This is the end for you! Alright. Time to rematch this roof again. Damn, the roof got hands. So I went back up to the roof so I could stock up on RC rockets because of how close they were to the elevator. I thought I needed them to disable this electric floor here, but it turns out this isn't even an electrified floor. God damn my pattern recognizing brain. Well, at least I have a bunch of RC missiles, so that'll be helpful. Speaking of helpful, not the infrared goggles. I don't think I used these things once, and there's a reason for that. So the infrared goggles are used to see these lasers that come from these consoles, and that's genuinely helpful and pretty cool. But the cigarettes that Snake smuggled in have the exact same effect, like he's fucking MacGyver. Though to be fair, there's nothing in the game telling you this, and I only knew about this mechanic because it returns in Metal Gear Solid. Don't worry, we'll get there eventually. Alright, Machine Gun Kid, where'd we leave off again? Alright, RC Rockets. Why did he have the parachute? It's not required at all, but be sure to grab the mine detector here while you're at it. You gotta shoot out a circuit box while you're being swarmed by these flying drones. Ain't that fun. And yeah, they fly now. They f Honestly, it's not even worth fighting these flying guys. It's better to just equip rations and run. Whoa, a high D.
and that's one of the two times I used the grenade launcher in this playthrough. Also, nice job, helicopter pilot. I see those blades spinning. You gonna fly up and turn around and shoot me, or are you just gonna just gonna let me keep doing this? Geronimo. No, we are not! Alright, I've made it to the courtyard. Just wait till you find out where we are in relation to the rest of the map. Yep, we're at the beginning of the fucking game. Actually, I think this is pretty good. It makes backtracking a lot easier. God damn it, I had the mine detector on too, and I still ran into the bastard. That's like turning the lights on to go for a midnight piss and still slamming your door into the cock. <laughs> I think I read that backwards. Snake, Dr. Madnar has been transferred to building two. There's a building two? I guess it's not a Metal Gear game without having to cross Mother Nature to make it to the man behind the nuke tank. Oh, look at that. There's a tank guarding the entrance to building two as well. Starting to think that Kojima has only ever made three games in his career. Also, Christ, was that supposed to be 10 kilometers? Are we sure that Kajumbo has a sense of distance? There's no way I walked across all of America in Death Stranding. I'm just saying. Turns out this tank, for the most part, is only vulnerable to mines. So I had to backtrack all the way back to this area on floor two just to stock up. But it's not like I could just walk in and out because these fuckers decided to have a cuddle puddle here by the explosives. I can't blame them. I'm sure it's a great bonding experience. Oh, God. Damn it! All right, I got the mines. Let's see if I can make it back to the tank without being abducted. There you are, you landship fuck. Fuck you. Ah, it's inspection day. Good thing I picked up that enemy uniform in the basement, which I totally didn't forget I had and backtracked all the way down there to pick it back up. <laughs> At this point, our big boss starts to act a bit paranoid, opting to switch contact frequencies from this point onwards from our trusty 120.85 to 120.13. Alright, so the frequency ending in 0.85 has been something referenced throughout the series going onwards, and it's a nice example of consistencies from the games from this point on. But ending in 0.13, the only frequency from future games that I know of that used this was Metal Gear Solid 3, which was only to open a secret door at one point in the game, and I'm pretty confident that this is just a coincidence. Actually, all of our contacts are now under new frequencies. This is something that's alluded to in the instruction manual, so it's time to put that good old pen and paper to good use because you gotta fill these out yourself. Anyways, don't mind me, boys, just a box floating in the river. Uh, hello, boss? Oh god, why are the cops out? Hello? Oh god! Perhaps I overreacted. On the roof, we're told that Dr. Madnar had been moved to Outer Haven's underground dungeon. And you know what that means? It's time to go to the basement again. Also, a dungeon? <laughs> That's not creepy as hell and doesn't have any creepy as fuck implications. All right, I can make this. Oh, what the fuck was that? All right, no one told me that there would be fucking androids in Outer Heaven. Bloody Brads, or Arnold in the original release. Yeah, of course the cyborg in leather jackets are named Arnold. You're not slick, Kajoma. You fell into my trap! The real doctor is on the second floor! I can't believe that killed me. You get your sixth keycard after Punished Madnar's assassination attempt, and a boss fight against the worst Firefly cosplayer I've ever seen. Also found this antenna for when comms get jammed, which I guess is an upgrade that's used passively because I never actively used this thing once in my time in Outer Heaven, and a flashlight capable of lighting up an entire pitch black dungeon. How many lumens are in that thing? God damn. Thanks, Diane. Yes, I know about the traps. That would have been nice to know before Punished Madnar sent me to the Shadow Realm. Some of these pitfalls are mandatory to cross too. You gotta book it across the edges of them before you're swallowed. Missing your chance means having to leave the room to come back to reset the traps, or, or just dying. I guess that works too. Also find Madnar's daughter down here, glad to make sure that she's safe. Though it's not like this is an optional rescue, as if Madnar is found prior to his daughter being rescued, he'll refuse to help Snake until his daughter is found. So, I don't know, I guess the right guy in the right place really does make all the difference. Ant 
antidote? What, is Metal Gear equipped with biological warfare too? Well, I guess that would make sense. This place does have a history with parasites. But no, this is for crossing over into Building 3, which, once the good doctor has been rescued, reveals this Building 3 is where Outer Heaven's Metal Gear is being constructed. 100 floors below ground? Fucking hell, that's a bit extreme, isn't it? He also informs Snake that the only way to destroy Metal Gear is by detonating plastic explosives on its legs in specific order. And that order being... Okay, I'm not gonna remember that. Thank you, 21st Century, for the magic that is digital phones. Guess print screen would have also worked. But to add salt to the wounds, he can't remember the final step to his cryptic leg bombing puzzle. So you're gonna need to improvise which is the final leg. We're gonna need at least 16 sets of plastic explosives, too. So you better make sure that you rescued enough hostages to get your class count up. Which, on the original difficulty, I believe this means saving every hostage possible in the game. Maybe not, perhaps there's a bit of leeway, I might be thinking of hard mode. And wouldn't you know it, the key card needed to move on to Building 3 is in the possession of Arnold himself, so I guess it's high time I find that rocket launcher somewhere around here. A hostage informs us of a contact who can help us acquire said rocket launcher, but with an awkward twist. Jennifer only talks to men with high class, which I get is the game's way of telling us that we gotta rescue enough hostages to unlock the RPG, but in lore, this comes off as a person who's not willing to give a shit about saving the world if it doesn't mean the man knows how to tie a tie properly. She'll only provide the RPG if you call her codec, 120.48, standing outside of what's normally an empty loot room. Not just any loot room though, a specific room. And the room is still empty even if you have the keycard to access it. But hey, I got my big old boomstick now, so come on bloody brat, let's dance. surprised Kojima didn't end this with luring the fucker to a trash compactor. But don't get too ahead of yourself, as the trek to Building 3 requires one more tool to let us progress. The compass, to keep us from getting lost in the... the desert. Guess the boss's animal conservation movement got taken to the extreme in the past 11 years. Why are these scorpions allowed to travel freely? Please get back in your cages, goddammit! This is what the antidote is for, as a sting from these arachnid bastards deals poison damage, requiring the antidote to be equipped on each bite. Which, yeah, that's fucking annoying. And you might think, hey, you need the compass to get across here, so does that make this Metal Gear's Lost Woods? Sadly, or thankfully, no. If you don't have the compass by this point, you just keep looping between screens. That is similar to when you take the wrong path in the Lost Woods, but it's not required for you to take a set path. Get in the trunk out of your right. Alright. Boss, I think this is the wrong stop. Building 3 is the most fortified area of Outer Heaven yet, with Snake being met by endless waves of red guards that refuse to let up. Thankfully, the trip to the elevator isn't too long. Now for a hundred floors of this shit. Alright, that was either the fastest elevator that I've ever experienced, or the floors are much shorter than the average Snake. Yeah, we'll get used to this elevator, cause we're only here for the diving suit. The final keycard we need is through the canal at the northeast side of Building 2's first floor. Nice that I could use the bastard truck to speed things up though. I'd rather get abducted than walk through the scorpion fields again. Abort the mission! Turn off the PS3 at once! Alright. Hello? The waterworks is just as bad as the elevator. It's like four screens long. They're building up a lot of suspense here, and suspense that seems to pay off once Schneider calls in saying that he knows who the leader of Outer Heaven is, only to cut the transmission with a short, oh no! What, am I supposed to be surprised here? Who else could it be than Mr. Big Turn Off the Console Boss? Too bad we're never gonna see him again, especially not in his own Winter Soldier moment. No siree, that can't happen! Guarding our final key is the final mercenary of the Outer Heaven Uprising, Dirty Duck, who's taken three hostages, and believe it or not, you can kill them. I'm not sure if you could get soft elect if you kill all three of them. I did kill one of them by accident and immediately unalived myself out of guilt. It's a good thing I ended up saving all three of them because one of these poor bastards turns out to be Jennifer's brother. I'm assuming that if you let him die, then Jennifer doesn't relay information to you from here on. The game is perfectly beatable without her, but it's neat seeing your decisions reflect how the future of the game plays out. What I wish didn't play out was this goddamn elevator! The trek to Metal Gear is a tough one, so be sure to stock up on rations, plastic explosives, and ammunition. The ammo won't be for later, but these rations are gonna save your ass when you're in these rooms where you constantly need to switch between the gas mask and no mask, to having to book it through an electrified floor with no way to turn it off. And gun cameras! Fucking gun cameras! Or at least that's what Jennifer says. Allegedly, there's a switch in this room that's hidden in the wall that you can destroy, but I don't care about my well-being. I now regret not caring about my well-being. 
All right, motherfucker, we had our laps. Now, what was that order again? To the right, to the right, die. I overcomplicated this fight a bit. Whenever I laid an explosive, I went back into my box to hide from the cameras and moved away from the bomb, assuming I would take self-damage. I didn't know that Snake was immune to his own explosives, though, so these little moments where I backed away from the bomb, yeah, I didn't need to do that at all. And man, I gotta mention the music here. It's a very short loop, sure, but goddamn is it menacing. The composers knew how to sell this dreadful feeling of coming face to face with a weapon so devastating that it could end the world as we knew it. wait till we talk about the NES version. That demake is crazy. All right, one bomb left and it's a 50-50 shot of getting it wrong. I'm a fucking genius. Oh shit. And here Big Boss shows his true colors, confronting Snake and admitting that he gave him this mission expecting him to fail, and with his death covering up the secrets of Outer Heaven. And yeah, it's a pretty lacking boss fight, just use the RPG and fire in his general direction. Even if you miss, Kiefer Sutherland isn't immune to splash damage. Alright, I may have just killed my dad, but there's no time for dealing with trauma. I gotta climb! Go, go, go! Fuck, wrong ladder! What a thrill. Snake escapes outer heaven, the fortress goes up in flames just over the horizon, and Snake, calling into Big Boss's codec, declares Operation Intrude N313 a success, capping off Snake's foray into his first mission onto the MSX, setting us up for the vastly improved sequel, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. But this is Metal Gear, and nothing is ever that simple. We still gotta talk about the NES port, and how that led to a game that basically made me make this video that you're watching right now. That game is Snake's Revenge, the bastard child black sheep of the series. A game that has never been re-released until this collection coming out in October. We'll get to that in just a moment, because the whole reason that this game exists is because of the success of another Konami IP in the West, Contra. Yes, it was the success of this arcade game turned NES classic that convinced Konami that the West wanted something more action-packed, an idea that they had when pitching the first Metal Gear game before Kojima came on board, leading to this bastardized version of Metal Gear 1 for the Nintendo Entertainment System to act as their guinea pig. <laughs> Wow. Metal Gear was ported to the NES without any of Kojima's involvement, which I know might make some fans recoil at the thought today, but Kojima had only done one game for the series at this point and didn't have much of a plan for where he wanted to take the series afterwards, with no plans for a sequel, so Konami choosing to port the game without him isn't too baffling of a thought. That said, the NES obviously isn't as powerful as the MSX2, so some corners had to be cut. Larger sprites like the Hein D and Metal Gear TX55 were removed from the game entirely, and the color palette is much more drastic compared to the original, despite the MSX2's use of more olive greens. This modified port ended up releasing five months after the original, even exclusively available in western markets for a short time before later reaching Europe and Japan. The port of course sold above expectations, prompting a greenlit to be sequel to begin production. Oh my god, I had a stroke reading that line. The biggest thing that sets Metal Gear on the NES apart from the MSX2 release, at least in my opinion, is just how broken it is. The cartridge doesn't have any kind of mapper chip, like Unrom, which was used in the American release of Contra, it allowed for a higher graphical fidelity without sacrificing the game speed as much. This same chip was also used in Pro Wrestling, Ikari Warriors, Castlevania, and even the first Mega Man, all games that you could tell at a glance have some impressive graphical design for the time. Metal Gear wasn't too lucky though, perhaps they thought they didn't need it for how slow of a game it was, but this came with some interesting oversights. Opening any of the sub-menus mid-boss fight will reset the boss to their original position, making Snake into Mobius from the TVA when going against any of Outer Heaven's mercenaries. Think of it like the pause trick from Mega Man 1, but somehow even more broken. This trick can also stop pitfalls as they're opening, but the space that's currently opened by them still has that kill flag set, so you gotta be careful because it will still kill you even if you don't see it. If this was my first time playing Metal Gear, I would refrain from using any of these kind of exploits, but since I'd already beaten the game and this part of the video is gonna be focused on the differences between the port and the original release, I'm just gonna abuse these because it's fun. A bug like this could also be chopped up to the port's rush development. Despite coming out five months after the initial release, the port was only worked on for three months. And due to the lack of a mapper chip, quote, Management wanted to differentiate the Famicom version a bit since the MSX2 had already shipped. Having a different intro was the easiest and efficient way for us to do so since we only had three months. 
So yeah, that new opening that this game has where you're dropped into the jungle outside of Outer Heaven instead of starting right at the entrance, that decision was made because of the lack of a mapper chip and the limitations that come with it. Masahiro Ueno, which I don't think I pronounced that right, but I don't mean any disrespect, was outspoken about his desire for the game to be powered by the VRC4 chip, used for games like Gradius 2 and Crisis Force, but Konami actively declined this request. Your guess is as good as mine as to why. But this is why the Metal Gear fight was replaced with what was essentially a glorified background element rather than the TX-55 itself. This was simply due to the hardware limitations. It's probably possible to implement the robot if we had used a better mapper chip, such as the VRC4, but it was not available for us back then. This port also has a password system akin to Metroid and has some interesting coincidences in its code. By typing the names of most of the major players in the game, Diane, Ellen, Jenny, Furby, and G-Boss, you'll be warped to the fight with Big Boss with some of the gear needed to finish the game, but what about if you wanted none of the gear to finish the game? Well, we've got you covered there too. Simply type, fuck me with a bunch of one at the end, and that's exactly what you're going to be telling yourself. Holy shit, this title screen is fucking fast. I guess if their goal was to make this game feel like a movie, then this title screen was supposed to be the high budget trailer that oversold the action, even going as far to not show stuff that's in the feature film. Spoiler alert, bullets don't work against tanks. I respect the porting team for putting together this new intro in the forest, even if they failed at adding to the pacing of the game, but you can tell that they tried by making the first guard you see feel asleep. But I gotta ask, who the hell are these other guys parachuting down with me? We never meet these guys, so I'm assuming the sharks got to them? The, the sharks in the jungle? Okay. Also, we're missing that outstanding jingle marking the beginning of our mission for Intrude N313. Even the theme of Tara is completely missing from the OST, which I consider a huge loss because the NES sound chip really complements the soundtrack here. But yes, Operation Intrude N313 is a go, and it's up to Snake to contact our missing Grey Fox and make his way to Outer Heaven after punching out some dogs. Yeah, you couldn't do this in the original game, you had to put these guys down with the bullet. So this is a nice change and all, but I guess that they thought that that would be too easy because now dogs can set off an alarm. Which, to bounce it back to being too easy, isn't nearly as punishing here. In the MSX2 release, an alarm was indicated by the number of exclamation marks in the alert. One meant the alarm would deactivate by moving to the next screen, and two meant the alarm would continue even if you move to another point in the map. Here, every alert is a single exclamation mark, making it a lot easier to exploit. That second exclamation mark is still found in the game's files. I can only assume that the porting deadline is the culprit here, but hey, I mean, it's making it a bit more bearable for this repeat playthrough, especially knowing that dying is more punishing as well. Instead of dying respawning you at the elevator of the current floor that you're on, now your respawn location is dependent on your rank. One star brings you back to the jungle area, two stars spawn you at the south of the first building, three stars spawn you at the east elevator of building one, and four stars the north entrance. I'm not sure why this change was made honestly, but I could care less. Okay, so you take out this guard here before getting into this first truck, which is now facing west instead of north for some reason. Grab the binoculars, come back out, and... That's some bullshit. I've tried everything I could think of. I have no idea how to not get shot here. You can't get a gun at this point unless I did something wrong. So I think that this is mandatory damage. There's a couple of points in the game like this and I'm, I'm not a fan. Hey, remember how Big Boss would trick you into getting into the wrong truck to warp you around the map? Here, this is actually how you make it to Outer Heaven, which is actually a change that I like because they do this again later and this is a harmless way of teaching you this mechanic. That some trucks will move you to different locations. I initially had a big problem with this but seeing that they do this again later, I actually grew to like this change. What I don't care for is how you get into the building. The way that you got into the elevator in the first game was by waiting for a shift change so that these guards moved out of the way, but here this is how you get into Outer Heaven, which I thought, okay, if this is the only spot in the game like that, that's an understandable change, but the shift change for that elevator is still here. But this is the only time in the game that's like that, so both of these instances are back to back, which is kind of weird for pacing. The old trick of entering and exiting a room with rations or ammo still works, thankfully, furthering my hypothesis that this was an intentional design choice. Once you enter floor 3 though, you'll eventually learn that you could walk directly under cameras if you're against the wall. And hey, that's a nice change. It feels more in line with future games, how you would stand right under security cameras to not get spotted. I don't know why they glow red hot when you get spotted though. You'll also realize here that soldiers no longer drop rations or ammo when they're punched, which could be a way to lessen encouragement to kill, or the complete opposite, encouraging you to shoot them more because now you're not missing out 
out on those drops. This part was made to appeal to America, so it's hard to say either way. The RC rockets are purple for some reason. There are still electric floors in other areas, but for starters, electric floors outside of this room are only triggered if you're caught. And second, and this is a big one, this room in floor 3 is the only place that they spawn in the entire game, making backtracking for them less favorable to me than just taking the damage and snacking on some rations, which has its own issues here. Rations no longer automatically heal Snake when he takes lethal damage, so there's really no reason to have them equipped at all on this port. You need to open up the pause menu to equip them like their power-ups in a classic Mega Man game. But speaking of, your inventory now automatically sorts your weapons in predetermined spots. Oh my god, thank you. Now all eight of my key cards are organized in a nice straight line rather than being scattered across my inventory based on when I acquired them. That's a nice change. You can also shoot while using the cardboard box this time, which I guess makes up for its lack of animation when used. Man, I really missed that one extra frame it had in the MSX2. Let's see, does the roof still whistle at me when I don't have the bomb blast suit? I have no idea what to call that sound. The way you make it to Gray Fox's hidden cell is by getting captured in the back of this truck, which is that moment I was referring to earlier. This is a great change. Your eyes are naturally drawn to that cargo truck, so getting captured there makes way more sense than just stumbling upon this area in the MSX2 release. Gray Fox's sprite, though, is no different than the rest of the hostages, so that's kind of weird. But I mean, it's also kind of indirectly humanizing for the guy, though probably not intentional. Trekking to Building 2 is now through the forest, which is, of course, consistent consistent with the new changes, that's a good call. Though the bomb blast suit is now the BB suit. Oh god, die hard man, I don't want to deliver any more packages. The Hind D has been replaced with a new mercenary twin shot, though it is effectively the same fight. If anything, it's slightly deeper than the Hind D fight because there's two of these fuckers to take out now. You still kill them the same way though. Stand at the side, lob some grenades at them, just spam them till they're dead. Hey, is anyone gonna tell Snake that these grenades don't have the pins pulled? Wait, are the grenade launchers supposed to be compatible with grenades? grenades that are intended to be primed with your hands? Uh, whatever, I'm overthinking it. Up here though, we find the one unique item to this port of Metal Gear. The Iron Glove, a passive upgrade for Snake allowing him to punch through walls. I already did that to save Gray Fox though, I guess those walls were just extra crumbly, but every other wall, you need this upgrade. This is one part of the port that was panned by Kojima for hurting the pacing of the game. Maybe it's because it was the only Metal Gear game at the time, but this change didn't really feel too extreme to me. This item takes the place of the parachute you originally needed to get to the courtyard to reach punished Madnar. I can only assume the iron glove was made simply for padding to fill that need for another item to make progress. But okay, they showed that with an upgrade like this, you can make a passive upgrade, so why didn't they just apply this to the keycards? Now who's ready to stunlock a bulldozer? I could have beaten this thing without the pause trick, but I chose not to because I wanted to show it off. You still need to ring up Jessica to get the RPG to kill Arnold, but you also need her for the compass for some reason. That's a weird change. Whatever, who's ready to get terminated? I am a monster. The scorpions between building 2 and 3 are a bit fucky too, spinning in circles until they're provoked, but believe me, they will be provoked. Snake saves the good doctor as well as his daughter, who says that we need 16 pairs of plastic explosives to destroy the Metal Gear's supercomputer. Now, I understand the disappointment that we need to take out this thing's supercomputer in this version rather than facing off against the dormant Metal Gear itself, and it doesn't have the same engagement as bombing the separate weak points in Metal Gear in the correct order, or even the turrets in the same room for that matter, but logically, I mean, it it makes sense, at least from my limited knowledge that I got from films. I mean, look, if one of the Ten Rings henchmen shot the computer that was powering Stark's Iron Man Mark I suit in the cave, that thing would have just been a box of scraps. So it makes sense, at least for Hollywood standards. Uh, that's a low bar though. Saving Jennifer's brother from Coward Duck now rewards you with him giving you the correct elevator during the escape sequence at the end. Yeah, instead of a massive ladder climb, we have a pick your own elevator puzzle, which is the worst game of the Price is Right Choose Your Own Door event. But, but uh, you wanna get out of here a live card. After taking out the guards guarding the supercomputer and jamming out to this sweet soundtrack, seriously, this is like the one track in the game that I think is superior to the original MSX version. Maybe it's not better, the NES version is a little bit more lighthearted than I'd like, but <laughs> I'd rather listen to this version if I'm being honest. Hey, you know how Big Boss is supposed to be some legendary mercenary? 
guess that's what years of running around with hentai on your box in the middle of the ocean does to you. Outer Heaven goes up in an epilepsy warning, and for now, the world is safe from the threat of Outer Heaven and Big Boss. Which is especially the case here because that sequel bait of Big Boss claiming he survived the whole ordeal was cut from the game as well. I even made sure that the sting was there in the original release and not added in the PS3 re-release. And yeah, it, it's only omitted here in the NES port. With Metal Gear NES selling well in the West, the thought of a sequel is, of course, a no-brainer here. But this one was an original game made with Western audiences in mind. Once again, made entirely without Kojima's knowledge. You didn't even know about the game's existence until a member of the team working on Snake's Revenge ran into Kojima on the train, where he begged Kojima to make a proper sequel, which he immediately began workshopping in his mind on the train ride home, coming up with the skeleton of the plot before he even finished his ride. It is important to know that while Kojima did somewhat start his own sequel out of spite, it wasn't because he was upset over the quality of Snake's Revenge. He'd even go on the record to say that Snake's Revenge for the NES wasn't a bad game, which is higher praise than he gave the NES port of the first game, stating in an interview with Stephen Kent in 1999 that he felt Snake's Revenge was faithful to the Metal Gear concept. Even as recent as 2009, he'd said that he doesn't consider it a bad game, though he did also state in passing at GDC that it was crap, so take that how you will. Regardless of how he felt though, the game never saw a release in Japan, coming out in the US in April 1990 and two years later in Europe. Now, Twitter user Arkhound pointed out oddities in the coloring of the logo, implying that this could have been planned for a Japanese localization, but that just never happened. But yes, this is an original Metal Gear experience for the NES, made with, once again, a Western audience in mind, and boy is it obvious when you take a look at the box in the manual. The back reads like it's Cold War propaganda repurposed for a Saturday morning cartoon. The following commands may be ignored by cowards, traitors, and enemy spies. Later saying, what do you say, Snake? Are you commando enough to handle this cockamamie scheme? Which is an obvious play on the word cockamamie, pronounced the same but spelt differently. This is actually the name of our unseen antagonist working from the shadows, Hayarola Cockamamie. A pretty clever name that is never told to us in game, so until writing this bit, I only knew him as Commander, which is all he's called in the game. This goofy take on Metal Gear though isn't inherently bad, and I don't want anyone to think that this is why I don't like the game's narrative. I mean, for God's sakes, look at Metal Gear Rising, easily the most ridiculous Metal Gear game to date, in my personal opinion, and saying that Metal Gear is a 100% serious story is just factually incorrect, but Rising at least had a message in its goofy premise, which was created with sincere execution. I know that I'm looking too deep into this, but Snake's Revenge doesn't really have a message, unless that message is that the West likes ridiculously buff men and giant robots. Kojima named the boss in the last game Arnold after two of these exact tropes, so I mean, maybe I'm just buying into exactly what they were trying to sell. The manual continues this tone, describing characters like its bios on the back of action figure packaging, with the exception of Jennifer. Yes, Jennifer returns from Snake's previous adventure, who is blatantly objectified to say the least, being called Foxy in both the manual and the back of the box. I'm aware that Foxy as an adjective can be used to describe someone cunning or sly, but this is the only woman in the game, and you're gonna use that adjective to describe them? I don't know, feel free to call me a fucking degenerate in the comment section for this, but I feel like it's worth bringing up. She's the only character in the game that actually does something out of these three. Well, okay, I guess that's not technically true. Snake couldn't have completed this mission without the work of any of these people. I mean, John gets captured pretty early on, which does help us at the beginning, that's really all he does. The 80s were just a weird time, but if you look at TV shows that aired back then, like G.I. Joe and the Transformers, it's understandable that Konami thought that this tongue-in-cheek way of presenting Metal Gear, rather than the existential environmentalism tone that the first game kind of had, would be too boring for Western kids, because we're stupid. Honestly, it's an understandable point of view. It is kind of weird that this game doesn't use Metal Gear in the title at all, despite catalogs at the time reporting this game as being called Snake. Snake's Revenge colon Metal Gear 2. Also, how is this Snake's Revenge? I doubt that they knew at the time that Big Boss was codenamed Snake at this point, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's out of the picture. But even focusing on Solid Snake, he's just following orders for Operation 747. Very little of this story is personal, which I feel rules out the subtitle of Revenge. But hey, Snake on the box art here is modeled after Kurt Russell this time instead of Reese's Pups from the Terminator, so that's, uh... <laughs> 
Oh boy. The title screen is still really fast. It doesn't have that unintentional low budget trailer look. Instead of bouncing back and forth between the title screen and gameplay, it goes between this and a breakdown of the bipedal Metal Gear walking tank, here dubbed Metal Gear 1, instead of the TX-55. That's a fucking boring name. But that's it. I let it loop about three times and hope that it gave me something interesting to look at, but <laughs> no. At least the cutscenes here are a step up in presentation, and I think that's something that I could say about this game as a whole. Regardless of the premise, compared to Metal Gear on the NES or even the MSX, Snake's Revenge is visually refreshing. There's a lot of vibrant colors and animations, and even the music and sound design are pretty good. Lieutenant Solid Snake, yes, Lieutenant, is brought back into action to investigate claims of a new Metal Gear in development in the... Actually, I have no idea where this game takes place, and we're never told. I guess it doesn't matter here, but it's basic seek and destroy, alongside his co-workers, John Turner and Nick Meyer. Two names you really don't need to remember, as well as Pilot. He's just called Pilot. But we don't need them, bro. Snake can carry this mission all by himself because he's been hitting those gains. <laughs> Holy shit, why is he so buff? Snake enters Operation 747 armed this time. This ain't an on-site procurement, as Snake is armed with a pistol and a knife as an alternative to punching. But here, you can punch rations and ammo out of guards again, and knives, I guess, destroy them? Meaning you don't get these drops if you use the knife, and making punching more favorable over the knife for the early game. At least I would assume. I never use the knife here, at least not until we get to the side-scrolling sections, but it's there if you like the option. Yeah, there's also side-scrolling segments here. We'll get to those in a bit. Gameplay is, for the most part, identical to the previous game, but we do have some quality of life improvements. Firstly, menus are much easier to navigate, allowing you to swap between weapons and equipment menus before dipping back into gameplay. This is something that you could do in the MSX2 release of Metal Gear, at least on the PS3 re-release, but not on the NES port. The transceiver is heavily simplified, no longer letting the player set the frequency manually, but I never even got it to work when I tried to raise my colleagues, so it's not like it really even mattered. Even when you pick up the returning antenna upgrade. It just didn't seem to work for me. I don't know what's up with that. Snake rescues a couple of hostages before our old buddy John Turner creates a distraction allowing Snake to sneak into this unknown facility because these guards were just too smart to close the door, I guess. Yeah, John gets captured in the process, but hey, that's okay. We actually probably won't ever see him again. I kept entering the screen in full view of the guards nearby, which was triggering an alert and breaking the cutscene from triggering, and the fact that that can happen blows my tiny mind. But you can fix it by re-entering the screen. Yep, this sure feels like a more colorful Metal Gear. It's a nice callback though to have the opening couple notes of building one's theme borrow from the theme of Tara. Which is ironic because that theme wasn't even in the NES version. But again, that's something that I'm gonna praise about this game. The music is fucking phenomenal. And I mean, really, that shouldn't be a surprise. This was Konami on the NES. This composer, Tsutomu Igora, later went on to compose for Turtles in Time and a bunch of late 90s NBA games. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. All right, so you grab your first key card, head to the elevator, which gives us a small tease of the 2D sections to come, take out a couple of guards, rescue some more hostages who tell us that our buddy John has been moved to no surprise. Holy shit, I'm the second rank already? That was fast. This guy also tells us that enemies need something called truth gas. Okay, so imagine a mechanic like saving hostages, which we've already been doing, but requiring a disposable resource to be able to save them. You might think, okay, maybe a key to save the hostage from their findings of whatever that might be. But no, instead we get enemy officers who spill the dice when you use truth gas on them. That is <laughs> delightfully wacky. Truth gas is consumed when you use it, so you need to treat it like ammo and rations. Just run in and out to replenish it because that mechanic is back for some fucking reason. Come on, this has to have been left in intentionally. I don't want to hear excuses like, oh, well, this was made from a fork of the MSX2 engine, and when they ported it, they just had to leave it in. No, this is the second time that they've done this for a Metal Gear game. I'm sure that they could have taken this out if they wanted to. Anyways, gassing officers isn't always the most informative when it comes to the story. They usually just spout out whatever propaganda their commander has told them. Our weapons are ready to be shipped. Metal Gear has no weaknesses, etc. Stuff that I'm pretty sure they genuinely believe, but, you know, it's a cult. Don't forget the SMG. Even though I barely used it, you can permanently miss this item. Cause see, Snake's Revenge isn't the sprawling Metroidvania that the first game was. I know some folks are quick to say that Metal Gear 1 is closer to a Zelda game because of its top-down perspective, but the progression throughout the world feels closer to a Metroidvania, with Snake progressing around a single, massive map that slowly opens up with upgrades found via exploring. Snake's Revenge, however, is more mission-based, 
level to level. Once you're done with building one, there's really no going back, and you gotta be sure that you're sweeping the area thoroughly for these upgrades. Soon after we get our first oxygen tank, ironically given to us in a room with, I don't know, what is this, less oxygen, poison gas, depressurization? I don't know, this oxygen tank has nothing to do with this environmental hazard, so that's a stupid fucking choice. This has no use outside of the 2D sections, which we'll be showing off in just a moment after grabbing these grenades. Oh, thank god the music here is great because otherwise I would despise these 2D sections more than I already do. These are more action focused, but this ain't no contra. Snake's arsenal is reduced to a knife that you can swap with a pistol, and plastic explosives that can only be used when you go prone. Yes, you can go prone in these segments, but only in the side-scrolling segments. I guess that's a first for something at least. It's good to get in the habit of going prone when you go into these screen transitions because guards don't possess any object permanence unless your eyes meet theirs. But just Jumping suffers from Castlevania Syndrome, where you can't change your direction mid-air. But combined with how fucking massive your sprites are, as well as being shot at, it's just annoying. I don't enjoy these. At the end of the tunnel, we're met with our first boss, the Ultra Chic Assault Unit. A team of robot football players, I think? Who made me realize that this game might actually be really bad. This boss fight fucking sucks. Each bot takes five grenades to kill, but all five of them just book it at you at the same time. Where if there's more than two alive, it is practically practically impossible to not get hit at least once per cycle, so it turns into a game of dealing damage faster than they do as long as you have the rations to survive it. And the best part is that there's only one room with rations that spawn on this current mission, and it's back at the beginning of the game in the jungle, which guess fucking what? I found the suppressor here by doing so. I know someone, somebody out there is going to defend this by saying, oh no, they actually wanted to drive you outside so that you pick up the suppressor. But god, that is some backhanded level design. I finally killed them about a half hour later, still running out of grenades and needing to whittle them away with plastic explosives. But Jesus, this is a bad sign. And the sad part here is that, in my opinion, this is easily the worst boss in the game and could have been excused by having this fight take place later on when you have more rations at your disposal. It's a case of them having good ideas and just shit execution. Oh, those kind of look like the spiky motherfuckers from Zelda with how they move. God, I wish they were those because that would mean that they would split up without me needing to fucking bomb them. Hey, let's also make them deal damage and push back on touch. Sure, why not? There's no problem with that since plastic explosives actually do self-damage now. This is stupid. A hostage on that ship, you say? Well, I guess that means that this ship is gonna be the setting for our next mission. The first of many points of no return. It's, for the most part, the same sort of deal. A new environment with a new set of tiles and sprites, but it's basically the same deal. Unlike later levels, though, enemy sprites are still the same as they have been, so we're not gonna see some enemy reskins until later on. So I picked up these flare bombs, which I assumed would behave like grenades, items that you throw, but as I found out, these are actually ammo for a flare gun, which, okay, that's fine, I better stock up on these while I can until I find John, who apparently has been moved for a second time and is no longer on the boat like we initially thought. It's almost like we're being fed false information. <laughs> but hey, if you needed a dose of helplessness, this officer tells us that Metal Gear has no weak spots. A truth that, again, I think he actually believes, but even goes on to tell Snake that we can destroy the ammo depot on the ship to bring it down, sinking the Metal Gear with it. And my first thought of that is, we? Even when he says that, he still just sits his ass down, so I don't know what this means. The Grenadier Unit. No joke named Harry, Curly, and Mo. A very obvious Three Stooges reference. Maybe that's why they look like King Hippo from Punch-Out. This is a grenade duel, kind of like the Hind D or Twin Shot from the previous game, but actually forcing you to move around. This is a much simpler fight than the Sheik Unit. You just have to run around in circles and lob grenades with each lap. And if you need to, resort to plastic explosives and change up your route a bit. It's not a bad fight, but this should have been the first boss, you know? Whatever. Congratulations, you did it. Pick up your key card and scream into the sun. The mine detector is back, and it's gotten an appropriate nerf. Rather than showing all the mines on the map like they're on the surface, like in Metal Gear 1, now they're highlighted when brought into this crosshair in front of you. You don't need to use the mine detector to beat the game, but you can miss it, and I mean, the change is kinda cool, I liked it. Alright, I've got my flare gun. Let's use the surplus of ammo I picked up to light up this dark room. Oh, never mind, I guess Snake didn't bother to hold on to all that ammo I picked up until I had the gun to fire them. 
dumbass. Guess I got no choice but to run back and pick up some more. That cannot be good. All right, let's see what they're hiding in here. Oh, that's a lot of Texas instruments. Jesus, no one told me that they were mass producing TX-55s. Take a look at the help section in your Alexa app. What? What can be worse than one Metal Gear you destroy that's inactive? Several Metal Gears to destroy while inactive. All right, Proto Pequod, I could really use a ride out of here. Go, go, go. Oh God, it's following me. Snake makes it to the pilot, who hits him with the revelation that not only were Metal Gear 1s being mass produced, but that a so-called Metal Gear 2 has been discovered. Yeah, just label these things like they're PlayStations, that's cool. Also, by the way, Nick has gone missing, that ain't good. God, I really wish I knew where anything in this game took place. Alright, we're at the campsite now. I assume that pieces for the new Metal Gear 2 are being shipped to their base of operation? Or maybe we found out where John is going? I have no idea why we're here. Maybe let's try to ring them up on the trans- Receiver and all right that's new that's okay this thing never really worked anyway ow i really shouldn't have made a big deal about this whole battery thing you find it literally three minutes into this mission and it works for the remainder of the game i'm kind of surprised though that the idea of your transceiver needing a battery was never revisited in later games that would have been right at home in metal gear solid 3 but whatever remote controlled missiles are at least used more than once like in the previous game on the nes you need to use them on these unsuspecting stacks of random shit to open up a tunnel to the next area whoa there's a tiny man in that hole Oh, thank god, at least his missiles are stupid. Make sure you're stocked up on oxygen tanks here so you can survive this underwater crawl. Even with maxed out tanks, I surfaced with zero to spare. So you really have to haul ass to make sure you don't take drowning damage. But ooh, be careful. This prisoner here says that John may be a traitor. Could that be why he was captured so easily to get into not outer heaven? Well, no, that would actually be an interesting plot twist. This game isn't that smart. John calls us for the first time since that part at the beginning of the game to tell us that he's being loaded onto a train with Snake to follow suit. What the fuck are those spikes in the floor? What kind of fucked up train is this? Ah shit, sorry bro, wrong room. This is another chic situation. This mini boss here just dishes out damage in a way that you can't really avoid. Thankfully, he only takes two RC rocks to take out, but you gotta pause to heal whenever you fight this guy. And I called him a mini boss because... Oh my god, I hate this fucker. That won't stop me from checking every room in this godforsaken train though. See, I found an x-ray camera, it's paying off. I just didn't use this thing at all in my run. You can use it to see destructible walls that you need to use plastic explosives on, which aren't even a thing in this train, so it's kind of pointless here. And that's gonna be a repeating thing in this game, picking up items way before they're even usable. All right, John, I'm here to save you. Ah, shit, you're not John. That's right, we've got an imposter. Please don't make memes about that, that's what he's called. And he's just a tankier version of the previous bastards we killed. It's the same deal here, spam RC rockets, heal when you need to. It's just that he takes away more than two. It's not even difficult, it's just you beat him if you have enough rations or you don't. There's not really any more thought than that. Which again, I think is really shitty boss design. Snake kills the imposter who presumably killed John, so we don't even hear from him again after this. And he's rewarded with power armor. Power armor is for pussies. Yeah, don't get your hopes up, Snake is no doom guy. This is closer to the iron glove from the previous NES port, allowing Snake to push certain blocks out of the way like he's in Zelda. But hey, John might be MIA, but at least we could get off this goddamn train. But at least Nick is safe, who says that the military operation is a go. Whatever that means. Haven't we been doing Operation 343, no, 747 this whole time? There's a lot of boulders around here that you have to push with your new power armor. I don't know why they retract back to their original position, though. Were these supposed to be minecarts that were later changed to boulders at the last second? Actually, I don't even know if they thought that far ahead. This first introduction to the mechanic, though, is just so poorly done. You need to push this boulder out of the way and to destroy this wall with a plastic explosive at the same time. Even though there's plenty of moments after this where you just simply push the boulder out of the way and move on. It just feels like this area needed more time to cook. That may also explain why you find the binoculars so fucking late into this game. That doesn't make sense to me. The binoculars, at least in the first game, gave you an advantage by letting you see a screen ahead of you. That's something that's a lot more helpful before Snake has built up his arsenal and increased his ranks. But we're over halfway through the game now, and it feels like there's really no reason for this 
this to have been introduced this late, if at all. Granted, it's not like I'd use it anyway, I'm using a map for this game. Just to clarify, I'm not using a guide, just a map that gives me a rough layout of the place that I found on GameFAQs by user Starfighter76. This was posted a month ago? What the hell? Who the fuck is even playing this game? Actually, don't answer that. The campsite fucking sucks to navigate. This whole area is filled with one-way doors that you'll inevitably walk through thinking that you're making progress. But it's not like a point of no return door. It's like, oh, you're at the beginning of this loop of this area and cannot go back. Enjoy padding your time by walking through this bullshit platforming segment for the fifth fucking time. Jennifer finally makes contact with us, telling us to meet her up ahead since she's got important information for us. Cool, yeah, I like it vague, whatever. This totally isn't jarring to see after playing every other Metal Gear game. I really miss sitting down with these Kodak calls with a bucket of popcorn. All right, I found mines. I can only assume that there's an inevitable tank rematch. <laughs> Fuck. All right, back on track. Whoa, the tank's got fucking turbo, god damn. Motherfucker, I forgot to pick up the mines when I respawned. Time for the great backtrack of 1990 so I could slap some fucking mines under this tank's balls. Come here, fucker. At least this was more fun than the Metal Gear 1 tank, at the risk of it being kind of bullshit. Literally everything this tank does can insta-kill you, whether it being run over, which makes sense, or getting hit with its cannon, which I guess also makes sense. Snake finally makes it to building 2, with new grunts dressed in military fatigues, but they're just retextures, so they're not that much harder. But it certainly feels like we're climbing up the ranks of this fucking place. We get our infrared goggles, which need no explanation, though will be mostly unused until the end of the game, but it's not like you can use cigarettes in this one because the cigarettes just aren't here because remember kids smoking is bad and snake is a straight edge are you smoking yet so there's multiple buildings in this region and when going between them you need to ride on top of these like tram cars and doing so puts you in a side scrolling segment where it turns into like reverse whack-a-mole where you need to avoid everyone poking their head out of the car to avoid setting off the alarm so you're not fired on by a bunch of jetpack men it's repetitive you need to do this a few times but i actually think that this is kind of neat but you know what else is neat math this officer here says that Metal Gear 2 was seven times more powerful than Metal Gear 1. Which, okay, even if we take the MSX game into account, we've never seen it in action. Seven times zero is still zero, dude. And goddamn, I wish that we could multiply this antidote by zero. That was terrible. Don't worry, there's no scorpions this time. The commander of this base is just an asshole who leaves poison tip spikes in his basement. No big deal. Okay, it's not that I wish the antidote wasn't here. It's that what it implies to exist, I wish wasn't here because this fucker is a consumable resource now, instead of being an endless fountain of scorpion be gone like in the last game. You get poisoned, you gotta equip it, but you also need to make sure you have enough. You have not heard of Metal Gear. Not that I'm surprised that you haven't heard of a top secret black project, but what, is Snake just asking about it the minute he saves your ass? Hello son, I just rescued you. Have you heard of insert CIA project here? You've either heard of it and you're just playing dumb, or this bodybuilder is a fucking dumbass. Whatever, let's just move on, let's get on the train to the next building. God hath finally smitten my asshole from the skies. All right, final building time. Why does it look like Dracula's castle? Is Konami just trying to mesh together their three killer franchises into a single universe at this point? Actually, you know what? I would have liked to have seen that. And hey, we even reach rank five this time. <laughs> In the last game, we only got up to rank 4, ain't that shit cool? Actually, this is more of a curse than a blessing at this point. Well, yes, your carrying capacity does increase with each rank, so does the amount of guards who rush you during a double exclamation mark alert, meaning more bullets need to be used to put these guys down, and it's even more padding. I'm guessing that this is their way to artificially raise difficulty relative to how far you are without setting specific parameters for each region. I actually don't hate this idea, and I think that that's a neat way of handling it. Hey, remember those spikes we saw coming in and out of the train? from before, how do you think we get around those from here on? Boots. Fucking boots. Why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious. Just like it should have been obvious for the devs to put in the bulletproof jacket in the game at literally any other point before this. I'm fully decked out into a killing machine at this point. Seriously, the pacing of this game is not good. I really don't need this Kevlar by now. And I can't even say that they learned from their mistakes going forward because, I mean, I don't know if this team worked on another Metal Gear game after this. Don't forget this directional microphone, though. Oh, I'm sorry. Hidden mic. This is another situational item that 
will only be used once in the game. I'm really starting to get tired of items like that. This room with the toxic gas fucking sucks though. The mechanic finally returning since the opening of the game alongside these stupid fucking blocks that you gotta blow up. I mean, at least here, we know how both of these mechanics work, so we know how to handle it, but it's another segment of just setting bombs and pausing to eat rations and just hoping that you have enough to survive. There's no skill involved, it's just making sure you have enough food. Okay, don't forget to grab the backpack here which lets us carry double the mines and missiles since we gotta use both of those for the commander when we find him. He's at the top of the structure, and now Snake is on his own. After trekking through a barrage of cock rocket statues and claymore bastards, it's revealed that Nick has been captured and fatally wounded. At least I'm assuming that's the case and has nothing to do with an alien about to burst out of his vestigial backflap. But before passing away in grayscale like he's fucking Optimus Prime, says that Jennifer is a spy working against us, and that Big Boss is on life support. Now, sure, this reveal isn't a surprise today, but at the time, you know, without the context of the rest of the game, the reveal that the commander is actually Big Boss who survived? Actually, yeah, it's still kind of obvious, but I feel okay with it. Yes, yeah, somehow the legendary mercenary survived the destruction of Outer Heaven and has been put on some hardcore life support in the form of being covered head to toe with cybernetics. Yeah, sure, Cyborg Big Boss, it's not the first time I've seen it. All right, I got the smoke bomb so I can escape this place when the time comes. Now, where is this? Big boss. Oh fuck, he's got geckos! All right, John, you ready for round two? Not, not that John from earlier, different. I know your name, bitch. Oh shit, I guess it really is Snake's Revenge. I know I've been nailing this home all through this series of videos, but ladies and gentlemen, observe the world's greatest mercenary at work. God, I can't believe he's letting me do this again. Please tell me he's at least got a trick up his sleeve or something this time. All right, now we're talking. Holy shit, it's Robert Cop. Would you believe this trend of a cyborg hulking out mid-fight wouldn't be revisited in Metal Gear until Revengeance? Nano machine, son. It's a neat call to have this fight span multiple screens though, like the tank. The only way to hurt this guy is to lay mines and have him walk over him, a trick that we learn by using d mike to decipher some mumbles in the walls. But you can also just stand next to him and lay mines faster than the speed of light with the power of our not turbo button. With Big Boss's second death, a kill switch has been activated. Metal Gear 2 is ready for launch, and it's time for Snake to meet it face to face. Well, not really. We at least save Jennifer, who is indeed a double agent, but was actually working on our side. Poor Nick will never know. Feeding us intel that she got from Big Boss, and leads us to Metal Gear 2, and the room where I got stumped for a good 10 minutes, not knowing that I needed to activate the smoke bomb to move on. <laughs> Oh yeah, Pilot just says follow Jennifer's instruction. And what did she say? Use this door. I am very tired. Snake makes it to Metal Gear 2, who's at the very least more interesting than the supercomputer in the last game. You gotta fire these RC rockets through a tiny opening and slam them into the glowing fuck me light from Metal Gear, while also trying to avoid the shutters opening and closing. But honestly, I didn't even care about timing it. I just brute forced it and fired the rocket as soon as it exploded. Eventually, I even got into a rhythm where nearly every shot made it through. I would still rather fight the TX-55 from the MSX game, but I mean, this isn't the worst. Oh my god, they just turned the light capsule from Dark Dizzy's stage into a boss fight. I can't fucking believe this. Metal Gear 2 is destroyed, and Lieutenant Solid Snake, rewarded for his actions taken today, will be remembered through... World Peace Day, okay? Konami does know that the International Day of Peace is a real thing that was established in 1981, right? I, is that, is this when that game takes place? Whatever, this one's at least worded differently, so I guess it's a totally different new thing. Operation 747 was a success. John Turner is reported as MIA, and Nick is promoted three ranks after dying for Foxhound, which I guess his family will be very happy to hear about. Cut to the credits of a weird Eddie Brock looking solid snake awkwardly smiling 
talking to the camera. That looks so weird. Yeah, I, I didn't love this game, but I'm coming at it from a place of retrospect. Imagine being a kid in 1990 who only played the previous Metal Gear game on the NES, somehow managing to fucking beat it, and then moving on to this game? I could see a kid genuinely enjoying this, not even ironically. Yeah, it's not good, especially knowing where the series goes after this, but I'm glad that I played it and gave it that chance, because from what I heard online, this game was fucking terrible. But I think it's at the very least okay, and makes for a great palate cleanser for what I'm gonna be calling the Kojimification of Metal Gear, with the game that I'm sure half of you came to this video solely to see. Seriously, this feels like the opening credits to a movie, complete with this fantastic, bombastic music here for the theme of Solid Snake. A track that, although has been neglected a bit by Konami, was remixed into a brand new piece for Smash Bros. Ultimate, which is oddly fitting comparing the return of Solid Snake to that game to this proper return of Snake here for a real sequel rather than what we got with Snake's Revenge. It's almost poetic. Unlike the previous Metal Gear videos, I'm playing this one without a map, or any guide in that matter. And that's simply because this game is much more coherent than its predecessors. It's totally possible that after playing the original both on the MSX and NES, and then Snake's Revenge, that I just kind of understand the bullshit that this game might want me to do. But if you're someone who's played Metal Gear Solid 1 before but never played this one, uh, the dots will start to connect on where that game got a lot of its ideas from. It's very similar in that regard. The game starts by demonstrating Snake's new ability to, uh, crawl on the ground, automatically finding cover behind some sandbags before we're given a call from Colonel Campbell, making his first appearance release order-wise. Everything here feels incredibly familiar, though. Where before we started with Operation Intrude N313 and a mission to infiltrate Outer Heaven and save Dr. Madnar, we're now starting with Operation FO14 to infiltrate Zanzibar Land and rescue the kidnapped Czech biologist Dr. Keo Marv, who we should be able to identify from a distance via radar because of an implant in his molar. Yeah, this might be a procure on site mission, but we're given a radar this time, allowing us to see eight screens around us where we're in the middle like it's a Mega Man boss select screen. It's not perfect, if we're spotted, enemies can jam it quite easily, and it might not work if we're in small enclosed spaces, so we might be wandering around vents not exactly knowing where we're gonna end up. But if we do get lost, we're able to contact our superior at 140.85. I also kept thinking it was 140.86 for some reason, so I kept trying to call Campbell and thinking, why aren't you picking up? Why have you abandoned me? We could also pull up a phone book and select people by name if we want to contact them, rather than needing to remember all of the frequency numbers in the back of the manual. Something I just didn't know about in my first couple hours playing the game, so I didn't even know that we could contact Miller. More on him later. We've got a whole extra button this time, and as a result, Snake can now duck down by pressing X, and when in this state, you can start crawling by moving in any direction, but you need to press the button to stand back up, which can be a little bit annoying, especially in a pinch, but we can use this not just to crawl under small openings and fences, but also behind cover. Stuff like tables and desks can now keep us hidden by going literally underneath them, keeping us out of enemy sight, which is gonna be nice because, wow, enemies got a huge upgrade since the last time. It also keeps us from alerting any guards that might be nearby if we walk on a surface that's a little loud by our footsteps. All right, let's get this adventure started proper. Oh my god. All right, that's on me. I could have totally seen that guy as a white dot on the screen above me, but I just, I missed that. That's something I had to get used to going from Metal Gear 1 to this one. Rather than the game remembering what's on screen currently, the entire map of where you currently are in the game is stored in RAM. Guards can patrol around the entire floor without being on screen, which I'm pretty sure is why we were given a radar so we're not cheesed out of moments like this. But as a result of this, that old trick of walking in and out of a room with a consumable item just doesn't work anymore. These items only respawn if we walk into a new area indicated by a loading screen, the little fox shooting a gun that orbits around him because he is so fucking dense. You can try this yourself pretty early on with this ammo crate here, though there's really no need to because so far we pick up the maximum amount of ammo at once, uh, but you can. But you might have noticed that that ration is specifically a B1 unit ration, a small bit of detail that I needed to remember because certain animals are attracted to certain ingredients and we need to attract a carrier pigeon way later in the game. You can still automatically heal yourself 
yourself by having the ration in your hotbar on the side, something I especially needed because of how brutal the AI can be. These guys have a proper 45 degree cone of vision and can even turn their heads to look around for you. Something that doesn't sound very impressive, but holy crap is it a huge change. Compared to the literal line of sight that these guys had before, yeah, this is huge. The whole 1 and 2 exclamation mark system has been retooled into this evasion system, where the alarm will always continue even if you walk off screen, and goes into an evasion mode if you haven't been spotted for long enough, where they'll investigate where they last saw you, and then eventually declare all clear. Something you can exploit for yourself by hiding in a small area and then just punching every guard that comes in to investigate. Alright, let's get a move on. Oh, come on! Fuck it, I'm reaching through walls! Oh, right, you can punch walls to make a noise to distract enemies. Stealth is obviously encouraged here. We don't want to alert anyone because we will die practically instantly. But if you really need to, there are some more direct means. I love that the weapon pickups are still massive compared to Snake. I don't have to worry about unequipping my weapon anymore to use these hands because I can punch and shoot at the same time. Uh, well, not at the same time, but I have access to because of that extra button. That's actually really nice. I'm still not going to use it a lot until I find a silencer. Wow, ain't that impressive. I may have taken a wrong turn in the vents, but look at that. Look at that fake Z-axis. I actually dropped down from the high up vent onto the floor. Wow. So we make it into the Zanzibar land countdown and we're introduced to Holly White, an allied spy who's been posing as a journalist to get intel on the lay of the land. And we can contact her at any point at 140.15. By immediately pestering her over the phone like a middle school crush, we can actually get her to tell us some pretty important information. Like how the compound has two basement floors and four above floors connected by two nearby elevators where the east elevator stops us at floors one through four and the west elevator stops us in the basement. Though rather than going into the Mario Brothers underground back rooms to use the elevator, we actually have to call the thing to us, which can put us in some tense situations if there's guards nearby. You actually have to punch the elevator button to get it to work. That's such a small detail, but I, I genuinely love it. But she leaves us with a really interesting revelation. It turns out that Zanzibar land has uh, war orphans from all over the world. That's okay. She she insists that they're just innocent kids and they won't hurt us. Something that certainly will remain true as the Metal Gear series goes on, especially the direct prequel to these two games. I screwed myself over by accidentally skipping some important dialogue that explained the different floors of Zanzibar. So I started cycling through her dialogue, trying to get as much information as I could so that she starts, you know, recycling what she says like in any other game. But it turns out that if you exhaust a character's dialogue, they just tell you, sorry, I can't talk right now, rather than, yeah, fuck you, Holly, stupid ass brain. Breaking Bad Baby, and fuck you Colonel Campbell while I'm at it for being on the right codex frequency rather than the wrong one that I kept entering. I could have gotten so much cool dialogue from you like, uh, Snake, remember to crawl under that fence. Yeah, you know all those small spaces that you can fit into by crawling? This is excused in canon by being small places that children could fit under. Fucking what? Oh, also there's a command room that has a map for the whole compound in it. That'll be pretty helpful for us later, I imagine, though we're gonna need some numbered key cards before we get that far. And actually, you don't find any numbered key cards on this first floor. You gotta go up to level two for that. I didn't know they introduced ghosts this early into the series. What the hell? All rise for the Zanzibar Land National Anthem. on the wrong track, that was we wish you a Merry Christmas. There's not much we could do here on level two aside from grab the first key card and get some rations, so we still need to come here, but I'm glad we don't need to stick around because this entire floor is practically covered in these loud ass floors. I'm trying my damn hardest to sneak around the guards, but at the insane clapping of my feet. Nope, never mind. I don't like this joke anymore. Holy shit, it's Psycho Mantis. Holly didn't tell me what this floor is all about. Why is everyone wearing gas masks? Play stupid games with stupid prizes. Ah, uh, no way, I don't fuck with red squares. I don't think that was dust. No, what the fuck? Is that a sewer, baby? This area is pretty small right now. It's just a tease of what's here, but we can find some infrared goggles. Now I don't need to self-induce lung cancer to see red lines. Oh, hell yeah, basement shortcut. 
How is it a shortcut at all? Security lasers are actually a bit of a nuisance now. They're not just a single static setting of lasers that you need to maze your way around. It's not random, there is a pattern to it, but you can't just sit there and memorize the layout of these lasers and walk through them without even seeing them. Well, actually, I probably could if I wanted to memorize the timing, but uh, I don't. I also don't really care about these rooms filled with gas because I could survive pretty well on my O2 meter before I start taking damage, but hey, it's still nice to have. Now we can finally see what Mantis is up to. Oh my god, the alert sound is muffled when you have the gas mask on. That's <laughs> that's kind of awesome. All right, now get, can you get that door open, please? Take off your gas mask so you can unlock the door. What do you mean that's the wrong key? All right, cool. We found Marv, except uh, no, we didn't. We fell for the old fake friend prank. I mean, the old fake transmitter prank. But unlike punished Madnar from before, who tries to kill us with a plot hole. Plot hole. <laughs> I mean, close enough. Who tries to kill us with a trap door. This is actually our first boss. <laughs> Uh, Black Ninja, who starts off the Metal Gear Solid trend of having a cyborg ninja in practically every game. A former member of NASA's Extraterrestrial Environment Special Forces Unit. What the fuck is the Nisfu? Is that a slur? This isn't a hard fight, but it's definitely a step up from the fights from the previous games if we're talking about quality. Even if I can get him stuck in the center of the room. Just wait him out until he starts throwing ninja stars at you and then open fire on the guy. Otherwise he'll teleport out of the way just like in some of my Japanese animes. Now fall! All right, this is when shit starts to get kind of wacky. It turns out that this cyborg ninja is none other than Kyle Schneider from the previous game. The guy that was about to reveal to Snake that Outer Heaven's leader was Big Boss, but then dies off screen. Yeah, it turns out he's not dead and is in fact now working for the guy. Now insisting that it wasn't actually Big Boss who almost killed him, it was Snake and his country. So after Snake destroyed TX-55, the Metal Gear that Big Boss was trying to threaten the world with, NATO launched a bombing campaign on the remains of Outer Heavens after it self destructed, making sure that there were no loose ends that needed tied up. It didn't matter if they were friends or allies, resistance fighters or children. The United States hit the remains of Outer Heaven indiscriminately. And one day, they'll even turn on Snake, he says. But also teasing that he, in parentheses, was different. The twist that this character is actually Big Boss comes later, but I'm gonna tell you this now because it, it does recontextualize how you look at this. Despite being on opposite sides and probably torturing the guy, Big Boss saw that they were both under the same bombardment from the United States. He saved Kyle and other resistance members, bringing them in and treating them as family, knowing that the country that they were once ready to put their lives on the line for is now trying to kill them. And he hopes that Snake could one day see that too, actively telling us where Dr. Marv is being held, as it's what he would want. Sending us on our way to follow some guy with a green beret- <laughs> green beret, I get it- that should eventually lead us to where they're holding him. Alright Schneider, let's go get you patched up from the three minor gunshot wounds I left in your scrotum. Oh, never mind. Well, thank you for the credit card. I used it to buy a mine detector because I think metal detectors in old cartoons are cool. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Mantis Man? Oh, all right, you could just say it's not cool. You don't have to fucking blind me. Oh, there's Schneider's Green Man. Oh great, it's an escort mission with extra steps through the lost goddamn woods. I mean, I'm fine with this. I'd much rather follow someone through the lost woods rather than the game giving me a compass and telling me to do it on my own. But I tried to step out of his line of sight because I knew he was about to turn around and accidentally walked out of the room, completely resetting my progress. Oh, we are so fucking over, bros. I finally get the colonel's frequency correct at this point, and for one of the two things that he's actually good at helping me with, he gives me Master Miller's transceiver frequency. And it looks like the guy finally got over his fast food addiction over the last 20 years because he's telling us not to eat too much while gaming because uh, digesting takes away power for the brain and that if I drink soda while gaming I won't be thinking too good because my stomach has to worry about all that carbonation. Anyways, we follow the Green Beret guy all the way up to Madnar's cage, which we could see from our radar is actually two rooms and that there's a guy on the other side of it and this first one is suspiciously empty. Naturally, I think that I need to blow up the wall with some C4, but the colonel tells us that this is actually tap code that we're hearing being knocked from the other side of the wall, and that we need to consult the Metal Gear 2 manual because it actually comes with a cryptograph for how to decipher tap code. That may sound intimidating, but it's not nearly as hard as deciphering Morse code. There's two times that we need to use this in the game, and both times they spell out codec frequencies, so you don't even need to worry about all those letters there. And this one gives us the frequency of 140.82, who turns out to be none other than Dr. Madnar from the previous 
previous game, revealing himself to be once an associate of Dr. Marv back in Prague, and that the other guy was moved to the tower building up north, the same one that the kids were telling us about an underground tunnel that connects us to, though that's gonna be for later. But Snake deduces that if Madnar is being kept alive and was captured by Zanzibar Land, then he must be aiding them in building another Metal Gear, though the good doctor seems to be a bit more excited about building this weapon of war than he is worried about it. This new Titan is already complete, and it puts the TX-55 to shame, he says, with lighter models already on their way to mass production. Yeah, mass-produced Metal Gears, surely that'll never happen. But now that Zanzibar Land has the last remaining nukes in the world, this makes the whole concept of a nuclear deterrent impossible. There's no assurance of mutually assured destruction, it is just destruction. With Big Boss backed by his new Metal Gear, which Dr. Madnar confirms it is indeed Big Boss behind everything, surviving the events of Outer Heaven, Zanzibar Land's forces have now set their sights on a new miracle energy source, Oilix, a plot MacGuffin that's not at all relevant to the rest of the story and is only mentioned in previous briefings of the series in Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 4. Metal Gear Rising alludes to a faction coming close to creating a perpetual energy source prior to its destruction in Metal Gear Solid 4, but connecting that to Oilix is purely speculation. We don't know enough to say if it's the same thing. Despite all this, Dr. Madnar doesn't want us to save him just yet. He tells Snake about a woman from the STB that they should work together with to try to get Madnar out of there, but we don't have a way of contacting her yet, and he instead gives us the codex frequency of 140.40 to put us in touch with Johan Jacobson, a zoologist that'll help us occasionally in our adventure, and every time we do, he mentions that he's eating something incredibly unhealthy. Come on, man, Master Miller would be so upset right now, uh, unless it was 20 years ago. I tried calling him right after this conversation, and he told me about how weird it is that Foxhound uses animals as code names because, uh, I guess he doesn't know what metaphors are. Just like a lot of my fans. Meanwhile, Snake's number one fan calls him to alert him about a minefield. How come none of you guys do that? I was just kidding about the metaphors part. That was just so that I could write a clever segue. Uh, but the whole Snake's number one fan thing, uh, that's real. That's what the guys called in our speed dial. This time though, as long as we have the mine detector equipped, we could actually pick up these mines and place them in our inventory as long as we're prone. You don't even need to have the mine detector equipped for this. You could just do this if you happen to have them memorized or you're using a map, which I'm not. How many times am I gonna run that into the ground? At least two more. Oh my god, did they get suspicious of my phone call? Thankfully, no. The space between building one and the tower building have been replaced with singing sand? Not to be mistaken with the singing sand dunes that just kind of blow wind funny. This is closer to barking sand, which, uh, no joke, has been losing its ability to sing because of pollution. Uh, that is very on the nose for Metal Gear, which I, I doubt was intentional. Whatever the case, this just means that whenever we walk by these two screens, guards act as if we punched a wall. But I'm guessing that the sand does some sort of chain reaction thing because all it does is make them suspicious. They don't know where you are, making it even easier to get past them because they just stop and start looking around. I'll never be caught between these bi- Fuck. Ah, that's right, the mines. I should have picked those up. While running away, I saw this small child that insists that he'd seen trucks driving through this bottomless pond that they were told not to play in. I think, okay, it's probably not bottomless. Maybe I could just wade my way across it, but no, I just drown in front of a child. That's not traumatizing. So I give up on that, thinking that I need to find some way to float across because this ain't the Oregon Trail, and then come face to face with a goddamn hind D. I can't take this thing down with a handgun. This isn't Metal Gear Solid 5, so I, I, I go back. So then naturally, Holly, the spy that she is, tells us that she knows where to find some stinger missiles, and they're across that same goddamn swamp that I just traumatized a small child in. Sure is nice that helicopters aren't able of tracking anybody that's running on foot, but at this point, I'm convinced that I have no way of going across the swamp and go back to building one so I could pick up any items I might have missed. And yeah, I found some plastic explosives and a submachine gun, which is uh, definitely something. Both items that I barely ever use, but I, I still need them. Now have at thee! Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. If there's shit hidden in plain sight, then does that mean... Big boss, you big son of a bitch. Thankfully, this part isn't too punishing, it's just a bit tedious. You can climb back up onto the hidden path as long as you're not sinking for too long. So it just turned into a game of walking straight for as long as I can, falling off, and then climbing back on and trying an adjacent path. Which is how I found out that there's a fake dead end in the path to throw you off, but I still found the way to go shortly after. How the hell do these trucks navigate these one-tile wide paths? But after about four minutes of trial and error, which really wasn't too bad, I make it up to that northeast swamp hut to find 
and the uh, stinger missiles. Was I about to say rubber missiles? What am I talking about? But I guess it's my fault for expecting those items to just be laying out there like every other storage shed in this place because we actually meet our next boss here, the running man. Oh my God, Snake is gonna kill Forrest Gump. He's the world's fastest mercenary. No man can keep up with him. Almost like he's the fastest thing alive. The red and blue blur, or gray and green. Okay, before you even get a chance to move, he demonstrates that he has this whole four tile wide compound to move around. Really showing that, yeah, Konami used a lot of technology to make sure that shit can exist on multiple screens. Uh, you need to sit here while he completes a full lap around the arena, forcing you to look at your radar to see where he is. I almost thought he was gonna become a joke boss in some capacity because of how long it takes for him to get back to you and how out of breath he is. But he's not wearing that gas mask for no reason because this whole area fills up with nerve gas as soon as the fight starts, which is the closest that this fight comes to being an actual, you know, fight. No matter what you're doing on this 2x2 two two grid, he's always gonna be running to the opposite side, so you need to make sure to prepare for that by lining his path with some of those mines that you hopefully picked up by the Singing Sands. As sad as it may seem, this is probably the best use of mines that I've seen in the series up to this point, meaning, uh, these three games. Now, how could a cheetah lose to a snake? That's exactly what this guy happened to be thinking. He really just wasn't fast enough. That wasn't an explosive in his suit. Snake's quips just do that to people. Anyways, we get keycard three from this guy, as well as a health boost, which is gonna be how the game handles uh, really a lot of the keycards. This is basically a replacement for the ranking system that we had to save the prisoners in the previous games. And yeah, I prefer this system way more. All right, so the singer missile's gotta be in here. Nope, those are children. I am not throwing children at a helicopter. I'm sorry. I hate people who use guns. Okay, I have to have accidentally pressed an attack button or something right after that dialogue box because I have no idea why that child just disappeared and my flesh started to melt. I probably deserved it, I'll be honest. Thank God the other one didn't start vaporizing me because this other kid here tells us that he knows where to find stinger missiles and they're on the west side of the first floor of Zanzibar's compound. And good lord is this whole area very beige. We never have to come back to this area on the first floor, so I'm guessing that's related. If you're in the Metal Gear universe, don't trust anything that's beige. Oh man, Holly was not kidding. The stinger missiles just shred this poor thing. It's really cool that the helicopter actually flies up into the air to start attacking us rather than staying at ground level and just sort of wiggling side to side. I'm still not sure how forgiving it is to actually aim the stinger missiles because you have to use the radar in the top right, but uh, I mean, I think as long as it's in the grid, it's fine. Snake, aren't you good in a cardboard box? Try posing as that cargo. I would, but I haven't found the box yet. Oh, also he's changing frequencies on us just like Big Boss did in the last game. Except he says to find his frequency that you have to look in the manual. So I think, okay, I better check the Metal Gear Solid 3 subsistence manual, but it's not there. So what are my options then? I guess maybe it was a direct translation, so maybe I should check the MSX manual, but no, there's still nothing there either. It turns out that Konami just didn't include a way to find his frequency in the this PS2 release of the game, and maybe not even in the PS3 release. So to remedy this, they had to put out an FAQ page with his frequency on it, which I suppose is the same as me having to look up what to do. But I found it through this FAQ page, so I probably did it just like a bunch of you guys did it back in the day. Though the page did spoil for me that he's gonna be changing his frequencies again later, so oops. Oh, there's the cardboard box. I was audibly amazed that that actually worked because I think that fast traveling in a box is really cool and never gets old despite it being used in multiple games. But my celebration didn't last very long because Holly calls in and announces that she's been a prisoner. Uh, not announces, that, that's a bit informal. Holly's been kidnapped, we gotta go fucking save her. But she is able to figure out vaguely where she's being held. Somewhere between an elevator and a water pump and I don't need to know what's in the rest of this building to know where that is. That's definitely in the basement that was supposed to connect these two buildings. That doesn't mean 
mean I don't have to explore though, because I still have to find a way down into the basement from this area. So I hop onto an elevator, hit the button, and suddenly I'm going all the way up to floor goddamn 20. Actually, two of the three elevators here both lead you to a single floor in the double digits, and only back and forth between those. So you gotta make sure you go into the right one and zigzag through this maze to find the right elevator to take. And thinking that I'm eating my vegetables before I go into the main course, I go up to floor 30 because I think that I'd have the least to explore. And god damn it, I accidentally skipped this dialogue because movement keys count as inputs during these text boxes. Can you just kill me already? I want to know why you're a fucking Spider-Man grenadier sitting behind a wall. Alright, it turns out I didn't really miss anything. This guy is Red Blaster, who does exactly what I thought. He's crawling around the ceiling, tossing grenades at me like Spider-Man, and that's really it. I need grenades if I want a chance at this guy, so I'll be coming back later. At least it's better than stairs. Oh, okay, when this kid calls Big Boss his one-eyed daddy, it's totally fine, but when I do it, I'm put on a list? If I wasn't missing that hang glider right now, I'd jump right off the roof. I can't live without my one-eyed daddy. I really don't want to use an explosive in such a small space, especially when a child is here and we got no hearing aid, but I mean, oh well, sorry kid, it's for the future. Remember to please keep your kids away from explosive devices, thank you. Alright, I'm about four hours into the game at this point, and I only just now learned that I could punch a guard once to disorient them, so after about a half hour of fucking around, I finally find out that the middle elevator in this weird spiral takes me down to B1, being the only elevator here that doesn't go one way. Are you a friend of the blonde lady, mister? Sorry, I don't give government secrets to children. I learned that the hard way from going onto the War Thunder forums. For legal reasons, that is a joke. Alright, so how do I use the sewer to get in between buildings? Whoa! Dude, this was supposed to be a recon mission, not Waterworld? The one-eyed man said that if a man in green shows up, then don't tell him about the blonde lady. Ah, it's all right. You're doing great, kid. Keep it up. So we go in, and thanks to our upgraded keycards, we actually find Holly behind a secret wall. And Snake can't keep it in his pants, so he immediately hits on her. I guess that's what being born sterile does to a motherfucker, except we're not at that point in canon yet, and I don't know if the rewrite for this version even considered that. But everything's okay. Holly's been in contact with Dr. Marv thanks to a carrier pigeon, but the pigeon's been freaking lost, so we gotta go up to the roof to try to find it before Zanzibar's forces do. Oh, and also she's changing frequencies on us, so we gotta remember that. Thankfully, she actually tells us the digits, rather than Colonel, who keeps it vague, which I'm fine with because Holly is probably the only person on codec in this entire game that I actually, you know, rely on. We're given the fourth key card and then finally sent on our way, which I immediately used to go find grenades in the basement. And I'm glad that I wasn't in a rush to just finish the game because I kept on exploring and actually found body armor and RC rockets down here. The latter I barely used throughout the rest of the game, but the body armor definitely comes in handy. Now I can finally kill Spider-Man. Yes, keep crawling left and right and stopping directly above me so I can hit you with grenades. I I can see why you're an expert assassin. I can't go on anymore. Zanzibar's haunted. Very haunted. So with the wall crawler defeated, the path to the roof is open to us, but the door to open us to the outside of the roof has been painted over and concreted. That's not a verb, but I just made it one. Good thing I haven't run out of C4 yet. Oh, there's the New York winged rat. Quick, Jacobson, make yourself useful. If you've got beans and potatoes, you can use them as bait. Please tell me one of these has potatoes in it. Ah, there we go. I'm apparently supposed to lure the pigeon to me, but if I just wait for the thing to land and come to me, uh, that's not gonna happen. So I end up just chasing him down until he lands. Get over here, you fucking diseased avian. Oh, okay. Help, whiz, Ohio, Kiyomarv. All right, I know I make a lot of Ohio jokes on this channel, but this one was not expected. So I call Miller and he's like, oh yeah, whiz is short for Wisconsin and Ohio is Ohio. Oh, I love this game. So I dramatically overthought this, overthinked. I don't know the past tense of that. He tells us that this has to be code for some kind of number. And I think, okay, it must be the number that correlates with those states being introduced into the Western Imperium. And I look it up and so Ohio is the 17th. So I call 140.17 because I can't even change the 140 part. I can only change these two digits at the end, but that didn't work. So, okay, I try what letter H is in the alphabet because that's the only one that's not capitalized and still nothing. Turns out I just needed to turn this text upside down and it vaguely spells out 140.55M. Not exactly sure what M has to do with this, but I can do 51 and it works. It's not a total victory yet. He's only speaking in Czech and I, I don't know that language. I 
barely even know English and it's my first language. So I call Dr. Madnar to help me translate it, but he only points me to a Gustava woman, tells me that they were never able to communicate in the same language, and points us to this STB woman who's somewhere hiding in Zanzibar land. So I use the number four card to head out the front door of building two, head back to building one, find a red key card, which acts as a combined master key for keys one through three, combining them in my inventory, which is very nice, still not perfect, head up to level three, and then think, okay, this is like Metal Gear Solid 1. I need to find a woman here, so, uh, because it's a Kojima game. And so because I'm trying to look for an 80s interpretation of a traditional feminine character, I see these guards up here on level three and think, wow, they got a bit of a dumpy. But no, this isn't it. I just never bothered to look at their ass until now. While I'm here, though, I pick up the night vision goggles, which, uh, don't blind us when we use them in a lit room, so this game officially sucks, and then realize, oh, hey, I could totally go up to floor four now. It's mostly a residential, relaxing, and recreational area for the people here. Though there's only one bathroom on this floor on the southeast side, as a kid tells us. Which is great, because the only way that we can make contact with Gustava is by ambushing her in the woman's bathroom. Ah, boy. Well, gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Why is there a child in this tiny, dark room here? Why does it make everything blue? And why is this floor full of mannequins? Why are they training with mannequins up here? Do they even train with these, or are these for other reasons? That was way less scarier of a jump scare than I was expecting, I'll be totally honest. It's actually not that bad in general. You can see which of these guys are real and which aren't by checking the radar. But hey, if you pissed yourself because of how scared you are of mannequins, that's okay. There's a bathroom right here at the bottom right corner of this area and oh my god, it's a bucket! Yeah, the box was already overpowered, but it's been kind of nerfed in this game because they'll start shooting at it if they investigate it, but the bucket just straight up blocks those bullets. That's fucking awesome. Wait, hold on, that's Gustava. Turns out Gustava knows about us and is actually trying trying to help out. And it must be a small world after all, because Snake recognizes her from the Calgary Olympics, because uh, apparently Snake is an avid Olympics fan. Gus gets in contact with Marv and has a conversation in Czech, which I used Google Translate on my phone to try to understand. He says something about a cleft at the north of the tower where he's being held, which is pretty close. It's actually a crevice, not really a cleft, but I mean, hey, that's, that's good enough. But she says that he's also concerned about Dr. Madnard. Not that he's unsafe, but, uh, well, we're left to find out for ourselves later on. Sure, it's a good thing that we decided to barge into the woman's bathroom because there's a secret elevator here that takes us to a connecting tunnel. And why do I hear boss music? Holy shit, it's a fucking Decepticon! The secret tunnel takes us up to that same area where Dr. Madnar was being held, but on the other side of the wall that he told us not to blow up, so he hands us the number five key card and joins our little RPG party that we've got going on. But when making our way further up the tunnels, the doctor needs to stop for a minute for a piss break, giving us some time for Snake and Gus to give a bit of a heart to heart. They discuss the idea of fate, their sense of purpose in the universe, something that further Metal Gear games would definitely use as a major theme. Talking about how silly it is that an STB agent, a secret police anti-communist force in Czechoslovakia, is helping some US special agent guide a scientist through some sewers. And that she wouldn't even be in this situation if her ex-boyfriend, someone named Frank, didn't have to leave her behind. And yeah, it's Frank Castle. No, not Frank Castle. Frank Jaeger. <laughs> That's the Punisher. Whoops. That would be, that would be something. Uh, she's talking about Frank Jaeger. Uh, Gray Fox? That'll be important later. But before Snake is given more information, uh, Madnar comes back from his little break, and I think we need to pat him down just in case he's got a gun. Uh, he doesn't, but I'm still gonna blame him for not being able to crawl over mines while having a full party. Damn you for making me actually have to navigate these minefields instead of cheesing them while being on my belly. Madnar insists that he goes first because I'm pretty sure he's a double-timing piece of shit, but just when Gustava tries to cross the bridge, she's shot down by Metal Gear? Holy shit, and it's even being piloted by Frank Yang. Bro just straight up shot and killed his ex-girlfriend. Do you think he knew? I mean, yeah, probably. Oh my god, Gray Fox and Snake both have the same scowl. That's hilarious. So Gray Fox, now working for Big Boss, takes Dr. Madnar back to Building 3, and because he's just so nice to us, he tells Snake that he'll leave us alive if we leave. Uh, that doesn't happen. Gustava, though, doesn't make it. We didn't know her for too long, I'm not too emotionally attached to this character, but it's still sad to see her go. But in her final moments, she gives us keycard number 6, 
six and her brooch in the shape of the Zanzibar land symbol. The item description says that it smells like her, so I assume that we needed to use that in some capacity, but uh, no, we never do. This thing is actually the Metal Gear Solid key card that changes shape when it's in different temperatures. And it's just as annoying here, Act probably more annoying in my opinion. But we need to find a way to get over to building three now that the bridge has been destroyed, and thankfully, Holly knows where we could find a hang glider. She uh, saw it once at Thanksgiving. All right, cool. So I head back to building one, pick up the second master key. This one is a blue one that combines cards four through six and use it to get inside this big mystery door at the east side of level one. And just like that, we've already got the paraglider somehow sooner in this game than we get it in Tears of the Kingdom. God damn it, Gray Fox. Come on, we used to be bros. That elevator will become your tomb. Oh, good. I've always wanted a large casket. Now, is this where we get jumped by four horsemen of the apocalypse? Ah, oh, yep, there they are. I'm getting reverse deja vu. That wasn't a joke, by the way. These guys are called the Four Horsemen, a top secret assassination squad. That's a hell of a title. Though, unlike in the future, when Snake gets ambushed by a bunch of people in stealth camo in an elevator, these guys just kind of sit up at the top and wait for their turn to strike. If you're too close to one of their sides of the elevator, they just don't jump jump down and stay up there, but also jump back up if they take damage, so we can use that to our advantage. Lead assassin squad my ass. Thanks for lucky number seven though, I appreciate that. God damn it, Fox. Now the only way we could get up to our paraglider launching point is by climbing up there ourselves because the elevator's down. All 10 floors between here and level 20 under constant alert. Uh, it's actually not as bad as it sounds, it's just incredibly tedious. Oh, ho, ho, you motherfucker, you almost got me there. But no, it's never as simple as just jumping off the roof like we want to. The wind up here constantly changes direction, so we need to wait until the wind is blowing north. And the only way that we could actually see which way the wind is going is by using our cigarette smoke. Or at least that's what I think we're supposed to do. Because I equip the cigarettes and then immediately go back to the hang glider to run back north and it works just fine. Man, you see that third island over there? You could get to that third island. If you focus hard enough, you could change direction of the conveyor belt with your mind. But all right, we're finally at the third area and there's literally no way for us to go back into the second or first, so uh, we're gonna be here for a bit. And it wouldn't be a new area if the colonel doesn't change his frequency. He tells us about this one using tap code, so if I didn't spoil myself from that Konami FAQ, I'd actually need to decipher it. It's not like Holly's any more helpful here though, she doesn't know anything about the prison area, so we're flying a bit blind here. So I'm wandering around the area, there's not really many places I can go, and suddenly I make it to some grass and I'm ambushed by Jungle Evil, the undisputed master of jungle ambush. And I think to myself, oh my god, is this the end? Uh, no, it's not. It's basically just a glorified game of whack-a-mole. Just wait for him to pop out of cover and smack him in the head with, uh, bullets. Oh, okay, I guess if I think about it, the end is also kind of the same there, but it occur- uh, never mind. Can I have the next key card, please? Thank you. Is that an egg? Oh my god, that's actually an egg. Oh god, it was a snake egg! Get- what is he doing? Now there's an owl in my pants too! That sure is convenient though, because these guards here know it's bedtime when they start hearing the owl's hoot, and when it's bedtime, they turn the laser gates off. I love the Metal Gear series, and this is weird even for those standards. I love it. So I use the not ends key to get into the basement here in this third area, and we're ambushed by Night Fright, an enemy that's actually using stealth camouflage, announcing himself to be the last member of a group called The Whispers. I I'm not sure if that's what Big Boss is calling his, uh, little army here guarding Zanzibar. I don't think so. That's a pretty weird name for it. But if he is, uh, I think he actually is one of the last bosses we fight that isn't Gray Fox or Big Boss. They set this guy up to be a pretty cool fight. He's actually invisible for most of it, and they tell us that we need to, uh, use our ears to try to find where he is. Bro, please don't throw it back when I shoot you. That's weird. I can't fucking believe that worked. All right, let's get a move on. All right, who spilled secret orange juice on the floor? 
And thus, Liquid Snake was born. Turns out I didn't find a secret exit through the floor, and I was actually melting in sulfuric acid that's laid out to kill rats. But Miller has a pretty good idea. Sulfuric acid can be neutralized with sugar, and what has sugar in it that we have in our inventory? A ration with chocolate. Cool. Don't forget about this, it'll be important for the final boss, no joke. All I need to do is have it equipped, so uh, hey, if you ever faced with sulfuric acid, just remember to bring a tin can with you. Uh, don't actually do that. And actually, you need to bring three of them because only one of them works per uh, puddle. Uh, puddle feels like a strong word. It's okay, it remembers which one of these you've caramelized. But right after you've hardened all three acid puddles, it turns out that you actually need to find key card number nine, and that it was Jungle Evil that had it, according to this guy from the Nixon administration. So we gotta go back to where we fought Jungle Evil in the grass and find key card number nine somewhere in this tall grass. Alright, I figure it's easier if we just sort of work our way around the edges and orbit our way in further. Never mind, I found it. All skill, baby, no luck. And behind this chocolate covered dungeon, we actually find, uh, what would have been Dr. Marv. Madnar is here saying, it's too late, he's already passed away, with Snake immediately pointing out the bruise on his neck. The mission isn't a failure, Madnar says, assuring us that the secret to Oilix is safe. Yeah, remember that plot, MacGuffin? Keo Marv was a bit of a nerd and kept the secret to Oilix inside one of his favorite video game cartridges, an MSX cartridge by Konami, in fact. Wow! The world's best-selling brand of computers, Snake says. And that cartridge is held safely behind a, well, safe that Snake needs to find a key for. Well, that can't be so bad. But because this guy is definitely a serial killer, Holly calls in to tell us that, hey, we're in danger. Holly dug around on Dr. Madnar, and it turns out the guy's been schizo-posting on Reddit after being saved from outer heaven, being dismissed as a madman and his theories all being rejected from higher boards. That's when Zanzibar Land recruited the guy and fueled his thirst for vengeance at its peak, making the guy work as a double agent and using his status as a once respected scientist that took part in a national tragedy to feed information from the west and east to Zanzibar land. And that included Dr. Marv's itinerary in the US, knowing exactly when to capture him and bring him to this new home country of his. Giddy at the idea that with Oilix, he could use it to power all of his ideas. An alibi strikingly similar to some of the others we've heard throughout the game, like Schneider's. The guy was just just desperate to finish Metal Gear and felt like this sort of post-traumatic world he's found himself in was the only world that made him feel like the respected scientist that he craved to be. He knew that if Gustavo were to be killed, then she'd definitely give Snake the key, believing it to be on his person in that moment, which it actually is even though Snake doesn't know it at this point, he tries to take it for himself. Oh, oh my god, I've got a boomer on me! I was probably supposed to use RC missiles for that, but I didn't have any, so I hit him with more C4 than any living person could ever withstand. He's still not dead, by the way, after taking some C4 point blank in the ass. I mean, if you played Metal Gear Solid 4, you know that this guy survives until the end. But now we gotta go find someplace cold to freeze the key so we can actually get it into shape and then bring it back here. But since the bridge is out, our only way of getting out of here is with the delivery trucks. So I trek back to building one while I'm at it and grab the third master key, which completes the Zanzibar RG B collection, and then head up to level 4 thinking that's where I need to heat up my brooch. I know I said I need to freeze it, but you can also heat it up to get it into that right shape, but uh, I guess I'm just not in there long enough because it's not good enough. I go into the sauna, wait for the dude to walk out so that I'm not, uh, you know, being flashed, book it back into the sewers to get to building 2, and then forget, oh right, the elevator's fucking broken, thanks for horsemen, I bet it was Archangel, that little bitch. And before I can get very far, the key's already gone back into its ZL shape. So I run back to building one, heat up the key, jump down the trash chute, go back up to floor one, book it to building two, ship myself to building three because that's the only way we can get back here, and god damn it, it's back to ZL again. So I take a bit of time to weigh my options, and remember, oh right, there's those underground tunnels, I could try those out. I'm not sure if I need to actually use these tunnels, but when I'm trying to get back there, I remember, oh right, there's this freezer over here that covers my rations with- but it turns out I just needed to sit in here for a little bit, because now my key has grown extra ridges. Which is, you know, that's great. Finally ridged for my own pleasure. And I'm pretty sure that the frozen rations in my inventory were keeping it cold longer, so I didn't even really need to stress out as much as I was during this point. So I head back up north, weave my way around some Decepticons in the basement, head back down to basement level 3, cross the chocolate acid platforms, and finally we... This isn't a safe, this is a fucking Doctor Who closet! What the hell is that up there on the radar?
did I just get the super plague? No, according to Johan, these are actually highly poisonous Zanzibar hamsters. Gee, that's great. But oh, if only we had some cheese in our inventory, we can lure them out of there. Well, actually, okay, the luring them out of there part is something that I didn't consider until dying a few more times. I thought maybe if I had cheese in my inventory, they'd leave me alone, uh, but no. So I sit outside of the rat cave, hold onto my rations to make sure that they actually melt. Oh my God, the rats are chasing me. That was the hardest boss in the game. And speaking of game, we actually grabbed that cartridge with the film in it. You could tell it's a game cartridge because it has the Konami logo on it. So that's, that's cool. But Madnar is actually still fucking alive and tells us that he will never let us get away. He being big boss and that he'll use metal gear against us. And I guess he comes to his senses here, realizing that he's not leaving a better world for his daughter and tells us how to destroy metal gear, specifically that we need to destroy the weakest points of its body, which are once again, it's legs that we need to blow up with grenades this time. That seems like a hell of an oversight. Oh shit. Oh my god, it's actually walking. Even in Snake's Revenge, the Metal Gear there didn't do shit. This is our first time actually facing one of these things head on. All right, Gray Fox, you wanna dance? Let's fucking dance. Oh god, playing this in a dark room late at night was a bad idea. Every time I damage the thing, every black pixel on screen rapidly flashes white, which means like 90% of it. I was literally squinting trying to finish this thing off. I'm so sorry. But after enough punishment, yeah, we actually beat Metal Gear. It was surprisingly easy. And I really doubt that this thing could have taken on the entire world's armies. It's not like they were going to. This thing is a nuclear tank and only they have nukes. Oh shit, I'm on fire. And I don't just mean that the stuff in our inventory that's on fire is on fire, technically everything is, and we need to discard everything so that we stop taking damage, forcing us to take on a still surviving Grey Fox in this small area in just a small fist fight. Castler actually calls us to remind us that Frank and Gustava fell in love back then and that her brooch smells a lot like her, which I thought, okay, cool, I gotta use the brooch to make him go, oh my god, the woman, and then uh, use that as a way to, you, to break his concentration. Uh, but no, our inventory is gone, so we're stuck doing this just hand to hand. It's not like we needed to use her brooch to actually beat him because the dude's kind of a wimp. He literally just runs in circles and lets you beat the shit out of him. So I'm starting to think that maybe he wanted us to beat his ass, which is probably why he was our number one fan, confirming that it was him that was feeding us all that information on the battlefield earlier. Whether or not he did it because he actually wanted to save the world or because he wanted Snake to survive to actually, you know, kill him, die in the hands of someone that actually cares about him, I don't know. But for now, it's the end of Grey. Fox, and though he's not gonna die quite yet, insisting that he was born on the battlefield and that he'll die on the battlefield, uh, even though he actually later dies to being stepped on by a British man, he still fucking explodes. But with Grey Fox defeated, all that's left is the big boss, who taunts Snake, bringing him over, and oh my god, he's armed with a fucking RPG. But finally, we're put face to face with the real big boss for the first time in this entire game, somehow surviving that kerfuffle at Outer Heaven, which is a weird plot twist that isn't explained for another like 30 years at this point. But we get to hear directly from the man himself about his motives, basically saying that once you fought on the battlefield, you are forever changed. Nothing can bring you back to normal, not power, not money, not sex, only more war. And that he plans to use this and his army that he's cultivated over the years to raise all of those sewer babies into future soldiers for his new wars, fanning the flames and creating more war orphans to adopt to train and feed back into this never-ending war machine. Believing that this is a better fate and a better way to change the world than to go back home and be treated like nothing, where the countries they served don't really do anything to honor the heroes and soldiers that fought for them. An obviously flawed viewpoint, but one that, you know, we can still empathize with. It's like he's got the right idea that that our countries don't actually care about us, but is coming to the completely wrong conclusion. And because of that, uh, you know, he has to die. The final fight takes place in this arena with sulfuric acid conveniently placed everywhere around it, turning it into a game of cat and mouse while we have to collect the means to defeat him by finding all these key cards scattered around the arena, opening the doors in the right order, and eventually collecting a lighter and a can of hairspray, which we turn into a makeshift flamethrower that can go through walls.
Well, that's good. At least he didn't explode. Man, what do these people have on them? But we've done it. Big Boss and the leader of Zanzibar Land has been taken down, and now all that's left is for us to get out of here. We're teamed up with Holly at his side, who's disguised as an enemy soldier. We're armed with a gun with infinite ammo and escaped to the rendezvous point. Running faster than we've ever run at this point before. But that's okay. No matter what we face, we've still got infinite ammo. Fuck! All right, that was actually pretty cool. I never got that part spoiled for me. So we did it. Snake and Holly say their goodbyes, the screen fades to black, and really, that's it. The sun sets over the ruins of Zanzibar land and the credits roll. Snake gives the MSX cartridge to the Colonel, finding out that Keo Marv's name is actually derived from a pun on the VRAM icon, VRAM backwards as Marv. And then that's it. The whole plot MacGuffin of Oilix is never brought up again throughout the rest of the series and could really only be speculated on. That was a fun little adventure, I'd say. And playing this game without a guide? Yeah, it took me like 10 hours. That was really freaking hard. 10 saves, 43 continues, and nearly 300 alerts with almost 400 kills. I am once again codenamed Deer, and I can only rectify this by eventually playing Metal Gear Solid and getting Big Boss ranked by the end of it. Uh, without save states too. Mark my words, I will fucking do it. So that, my friends, was the origins of Metal Gear. Well, at least the series, not so much the lore. That's gonna be for a completely different video. But next time we look at Metal Gear here on the channel, it'll be with one that I'm sure you've been waiting for. Metal Gear Solid for the PlayStation 1. I almost forgot what console it came out on. So look forward to that once the collection comes out this October. I might just uh, marathon all of them. Who knows? And hey, if you ended up playing these games on that collection because of this video, or if you're watching this in the future and you played them for the first time and you stumbled upon this video for whatever reason, let me know. I'd love to hear what you guys thought. And I will uh, see you guys next time.